appreciate them in terms of the content itself are so up to date and up to the level of contemporary industry practices that we find it very useful to our decision making process and also in terms of our management decisions and also leadership within the organizations. Can you help us to improve our competency as well as our capability as a management as well as uh, leadership? It gives us chances to uh, learn at the same time while we work. Once you complete the program, you will find yourself transformed from your thinking process uh, and also your perspective on issues that happen uh, within the organization uh, and you will see the outcome of your work change generously. GSB is fully committed to numerous CSR programs. GSB lectures integrate principles and elements of sustainability and responsible business practices in the course outline and through students' presentations. Our students are also directly involved in environmental sustainability activities such as the uh, Penang National Park, uh, Zero Waste Penang, and the Recycling Culture for a Better Environment Projects. GSP is growing strong and we have built strategic alliance with other business school and industry partners all over the world. As a leading business school and international learning hub, GSP collaborates with prominent scholars in public education, business research and development. As a team, we continuously evolve and make ourselves present as a business school of choice. While we are looking young, we pride ourselves in our passion to make a difference and our openness to better. Come experience it and take the first step to realizing your full potential with us. Thank you. I would like to call upon Ms. Teresa, our international PhD student, for the honor submission. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, the most beneficent, the sustainer, the provider, the creator, the king of the day of reckoning, we pray we will continue to guide us to the straight paths. Islam has great importance for knowledge seeking. In the first five verses reviewed in the Holy Quran, the word Ikra, meaning Greek, was mentioned twice, and the word Kalam, meaning pen, was mentioned once, and the word Adam, meaning teach, was mentioned twice. Therefore, seeking knowledge with the intention to benefit oneself and the people is rewarded in Islam. So whoever seek knowledge and help the people to learn will definitely be rewarded. Therefore, this workshop or this forum on blockchain is another avenue to seek knowledge and to be rewarded. We pray to Allah that as we commence this forum, we seek his guidance, we seek his knowledge, we seek his protection. We pray to Allah to bless the speakers, make it easy for them to deliberate on the subject matter of today, and grant them sources in all their endeavors. As for we participants, we pray to Allah to make our affairs easy for us, increase us in knowledge, and grant us safe journeys to our respective destinations at the end of this. Um, forum. May Allah let us benefit from the knowledge of this forum. Amen. Open and answer your feet in your asana. Of your aunt, Roti Hassan, the Makina has a lot of. Allah, whom I did not ask, I would have been very cool meeting. A GD, why GD, my big name, a mother, Nana. But now to be a mission of me. A GD, why GD.
Thank you, Mr. Izzo, for the beautiful prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all distinguished guests, faculty members, sponsors, students, and ladies and gentlemen. A very good, fresh, and wonderful morning to all of you. On behalf of Graduate School of Business, USM, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Freddy, and joining me today is Siti Farah. We are your MCs for today. We appreciate your time taking taking your time off your busy schedules to join us today, and we hope that you will find this forum entitled Blockchain, Transforming the Accountancy Profession to be Fruitful and Engaging. This forum is part of GSB's initiative to bring together industry leaders, students, faculty members, and society in an engaging dialogue and discussion to stay abreast with the current developments in the wake of Industry Revolution 4.0. To officially begin today's program, I'm pleased to invite Professor Dr. Azad Amran, the Dean of GSB, to deliver his welcome address. Please welcome. Okay, Bismillah, Assalamu alaikum, and very good morning, everyone. Um, uh, first and foremost, I uh, would like to thank everyone for making your time to come and join our program uh, this morning, uh, which is fully organized by our MBA students, right? Uh, who are now taking the accounting subject, which is one of the core uh, subjects in our MBA course, our MBA program. Um, the topic for today is blockchain, transforming for accounting profession. Uh, my background is also accounting, but that was three decades ago, you know, uh, and that time when I first, uh, you know, practiced my knowledge, uh, I remember I used UBS accounting, right? And when I searched at Google, still, the companies that still exist, but they now use more advanced technology, right? But that time, the UBS accounting was, uh, I mean, the, the purpose is really for the recording and presentation. And now uh, people are talking about cloud computing or accounting. And eventually they talk about blockchain, you know, and then the element of cyber security. So I think uh, this is a platform, which is a very important platform, especially for GSP students for them to listen to the, you know, the up to date uh, or the latest technology being practiced uh, in the industry. And we have a panel of speakers, uh, the esteemed panel of speakers, Madam Suzanne uh, from EY, uh, Mr. Morali, Mr. Edgar, and Mr. Vincent. I got to know that he missed flight this morning, but he will do this, uh, his presentation through Google Google or Skype, something like that, right? So this is the technology. So you, you know, the, the speakers may not need to be present here, can be anywhere, but you can, you can still listen to uh, his presentation. So before I end my welcome speech, uh, sorry, I just want to welcome you again. And also my big thank you to the organizing committee, which is um, the advisor, I mean, Dr. Yuvarash and also Dr. Fatia, um, to my uh, accounting students, the MBA students, and to all participants, I wish this uh, forum will be the fruitful one. Uh, at least we'll go back some, uh, you know, some thankful point for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lokazan, for your welcome advice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start the forum in a few minutes' time. This forum will be moderated by our very own senior lecturer, Dr. Theo Aikin. Please allow me to share with you a brief breakdown of our moderator. <coughs> Dr. Theo I. Payne has a Bachelor in Accountancy, Master in Information Technology, Doctor in Business Administration with Presentation in Enterprise Risk Management. She is still joining as a senior lecturer in USM since 2011. She has 10 years working experience related to accounting information system, ERP system, business consultancy training, and open system web-based applications. 
Without wasting more time, I would like to pass the stage to Dr. Theo Arkin as the moderator for today's forum. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So, a warm welcome to Tuesday Online Graduate School of Business, Accounting Forum on Blockchain Transforming the Accounting State Profession. So, before we begin, let us do a little warming up. Uh, by requesting you to participate in this online interactive survey, you may now take out your mobile phone yeah, or your tablet and please go to this website www.menti.com. And let's start the note positive for today. We're going to give you a lucky number for today. It's Saturday. So <laughs> the lucky number that you have as uh, you have, you can see on the screen, is the code 63685. So what you're required to do, guys, is to enter three words that comes to your mind when we talk about blockchain. If you only have one word that comes to your mind, please just add, uh, I mean, enter the same word three times. So we're going to have about 60 seconds for this activity. Let's, let's take a look at what's in your mind the first thing in the morning. Yeah, so the results is going to be displayed in a word cloud. So the results that you display online, if I may uh, seek the assistance of the um, <coughs> committee to show or to share with us what's the online results of your voting. So have you guys done three words that comes to your mind when we talk about blockchain? Okay, all done? All good? Now, while they uh, try to uh, display the results that what comes to your mind uh, for this blockchain, probably I'll just uh, get uh, started with the opening of the forum. So guys, another numbers for today. US dollar 11.7 billion. This is the expected worldwide spending on blockchain solutions in 2022. That's about um, two years from now. And this is based on the data from Statista, which is published in August 2019 and has shown tremendous growth from US dollar 1.5 billion in 2018 and US dollar 2.7 billion in 2019 and the US dollar 11.7 billion in 2022. And based on their study as well, the financial sector accounts for over 60% of the market value of blockchain in 2018. So as you may have aware, blockchain is a distributed secure ledger that means Cryptography will appear to peer network technology to work transactions into blocks and store them in a temporal element info chain. So a blockchain system enables transactions to be written directly onto a single ledger, which creates an interlocking system of records. So in a perfect world, blockchain and the world of accounting will be close that fellas working side by side to create the perfect systems of recording storage, administration, management, and monitoring of transactions. So, my dear audience, how could blockchain transform the company? Let's find out today. And we are honored to have our distinguished panel speakers here. Um, we have Mr. Edgar Gasper, the Chief Operating Officer from uh, Synergy Technologies and Energy in the Hub. We have Mr. Vincent Lee, who will be joining us over at uh, the uh, over Google Meet with on. And we have Mr. Murali G. Alayudu, that is from Intel, so he's the Digital Transformation Leader. And we have Ms. Susanna Lee, she's the EY ASEAN Technology Risk Leader, Partner Malaysia Risk Advisory. So, that is as mentioned by the MC just now, given that blockchain rapid rise into the accounting consciousness is no surprise that the accountants have many questions about this technology whether you specialize in auditing, in tax, or accounting services. So we will address your questions during the group panel discussion later on, which is after all the panel speakers' speech. So if I may request, you can you just write down your most easy questions that you have related to today's topic, 
in the paper that the committee has inserted in your brief bag. So our committee will then collect this from you at the end of the fourth speaker talk. So as you can see on the display, we have a total of 156 who has just participated in our uh, little activity here. And what is the biggest word that you can see from this word cloud? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. So when we talk about blockchain, apparently Bitcoin is the term that comes to your mind and followed by um, security. So security issues, crypto currency, um, data. Oh yeah, I missed technology guys. So sorry. So it's kind of counting. Yeah. So this is the result. So that is the keywords that comes to your mind when we talk about uh, blockchain. And without further ado, may I welcome our first speaker for the day. <clears throat> so Mr. Edgar has been a corporate advisor to Synergy Technology Malaysia's in Rubber Heart and was recently appointed as the Chief Operating Officer. He served 17 years at Dell Technologies where he managed the South Asia reverse logistics operation and the Asia Pacific IT application requirements within the Dell asset recovery business. So Mr. Edgar will share on blockchain and industry 4.0 as well as some essential knowledge on blockchain. So if I would like Mr. Edgar to take the Hi, good morning, everybody. This place is uh, this place is lovely. <laughs> um, thank you for inviting us. It's, uh, it's an honor to speak here. Uh, I'm going to uh, try and uh, get into the meat of it because sorry, I'm going to try and get into the meat of it uh, quickly because we have a limited amount of time. And um, as you know, the topics at hand, a lot of buzzwords are are here, right? You've got your industry four, you've got your blockchain, you've got cryptocurrency. We're not going to get into deep, too deep on this in 10 minutes. So I'm going to try and uh, give a narrative that might appeal to you guys to try and understand why is it um, blockchain has a space um, in the future of accounting. Uh, I think a lot of the problems come around understanding the technology or, or why What's, what's the big deal, right? What's the difference? So I think we will address it from uh, what has changed. Um, so up to today, if, uh, if, you, if you see the difference, uh, the different revolutions that have happened over the past um, cycles, right? This is, this is going back to the 1700s, 1800s. We had machination, we had mass production, and we had automation. Uh, all of this had happened um, up to the 90s and you know up to now why has accounting remained where it is right there's, there's never been a need to change so what's the big difference and from what i can see or from what we understand we can see the big difference is up to now up to industry three you would have people run activities right it, it is it is mostly managed by people and Nowadays, we're talking about industry four, and this is us handing over the reins, the decision-making reins to people and people and companies that are, that are both present online as well as you know, running on decision-making software. This is where you get your ERPs come into, the play, uh, come into the picture, right? They help you plan what you need to do for your businesses. Um, but the slow part of it all, is us because we are uh, needing to deal uh, with people. Right now, the, the conversation is moving towards what happens when you let the machines sort of help you run your business. So I'm gonna pull out the two sides, right? So the, the narrative I'm trying to show here is that uh, the big difference we are facing in this environment is on the left, that is the past, right? where you'd have business, businesses interact with each other. And that is where management comes in, accounting, finance, and all the decision makers come in to make sure that both parties are honest right, when we transact. Um, but that honesty comes at a bit of a cost, 
right? There's, there's, there's a bit of a speed cost. You have things like settlement plus tree and, and things like that. Why, why is it that we actually need to have things like this today when if you think about it, everything is already online? Um, I think most of the transactions that we go through are easily pulled off from some system or other, right? If you, if you had some form of an AI come into the picture and be able to communicate with all the banks and all the vendors that have submitted payments, it's automatically going to be able to compile an image of what the report should look like. You don't even need blockchain to come into the picture to, to participate in, in this discussion at this point. Yet, here we are talking about it. So what's the big difference here? The big difference is going to be trust. Because up to today, right, even though everything is online, when we communicate between companies and between bank accounts and between, uh, you know, uh, governments, it's always going to be a matter of, I need to hold one side of the accounts, right? There's always going to be a check and a, and a counter check. Um, so this, this requires people to always be balancing the, the uh, risk. So this is why you, you have management and accounting, right? You come in and you make sure that these transactions are there. Even though you told me you gave me the money, I still want to make sure. And I'm going to set my people to go out and pull the records and validate and get management approval before I put it on the table. So all of that, all of that comes at a cost. And, and the cost that we can see is that there's going to be a cost of efficiency versus risk. So the purpose of, of, of me introducing blockchain to you is to try and get you into the mindset of it is not really just about money. The biggest concern that blockchain addresses is trust. Because everything that blockchain can do can be done by AI, right? But the only big difference is it publishes it to a public ledger that everybody can be held accountable to. And that's going to be the meat of the topic. So how do blocks and chains help? Exactly, right? So before I go into that, I've tried to, to bring this to an analogy that's, that's more familiar with people in the room. I am not from an accounting background, so I hope I've done a decent enough job. Throw me questions if you're not sure later on. Right. So if you look on the screen, right, um, on the top part, this is something that I sort of understand from my days uh, working in an MNC, right? Um, you'd have the gathering phase where someone in account would say, please put all your source documents in this area. And then if by the time I don't put it in by a deadline, some lady with a stick comes and beats me, you know, to submit all my documentation in time. And then they take it all away, you know, after the deadline, process it, file it, get an approval, say that everything is okay. And then you can pull reports. And then those reports are what we use to run our business, right? So an example I'm giving here is we have a weekly report on top. So number one on the far, on the far right is gathering the, the source documents. Number two is processing it. And number three is filing it. In the, in, in the same concept, right? Blockchains do the exact same thing, right? You actually have um, all the transactions that are being made on a blockchain environment broadcast to everybody. That network then consolidates all that information into ledgers, basically into blocks. They put it for a consensus mechanism to work on. And that consensus mechanism is going to be the core of our discussion after this. But the purpose of that consensus mechanism is to make sure that whatever results get published to the public are going to be trustable results, right? And then it publishes out. So what's, what's the big difference here? If you look on top, whether you're doing a weekly or monthly report, for example, it's going to take you from the time of gathering the source documents to the time of processing to the time of reporting, probably a week or so if it's a weekly report, right? And then there's going to be a lot of, of work. There's going to be involvement of people to go in and chase those people who are stragglers like me, you know, who are not giving my stuff up in time, right? And by that time, it's already one week. But in the world of Industry 4.0, the machines aren't going to wait for us meat bags to take our time with this, right? They're going to be trying to make decisions on the fly. They need data. They need access to this information immediately. So in a blockchain environment, I'm going to use Bitcoin as an example, right? And in Bitcoin, that whole process of settling your transactions, right? I, I consider this a settlement. Every 
cycle is 10 minutes. And Bitcoin is one of the slower blockchains. You have higher speed blockchains out there that are trying to tackle um, you know, uh, high speed transactions. So they, they can go down as much as five seconds, three second blocks. And what's happening is every time these blocks are completed, they are settled, right? So everything that appears on the blockchain is data that is actually considered valid, right? And so the, the, the main purpose here is to convey that speed. The first of the two issues that we looked at just now was speed and trust, right? So for speed, blockchain allows us to do settlements in a very, very rapid rate. And depending on what we need, there's, there's many different types of blockchains. Uh, obviously, we can't go into it right now, but this is talking about speed. One more thing to keep in mind before I go to the next slide is I said source documents, right? We have to talk about source documents because those are spending that's already done. All right. And then later we're trying to prove who spent on what. Whereas in a blockchain environment, whenever you submit transactions, before they are settled, before they are mined or verified, they are not transacted. So the moment the consensus comes together and says, this is a valid transaction, at the same point that it gets published and be, uh, be functional as a report, is that same moment that the transaction happens. And if it does not happen, that transaction does not occur. So this gives you a very fluid environment, right? You're not, you're not worried about how come this source document doesn't tally. It's already there. This is, this is one of the beauty of blockchain. So it's fast and it's also accurate, right? You're, you're not going to get a transaction value and an amount transferred that are not the same on the same uh, consensus. That's impossible. So that, that in itself, you know, adds so much value aside from the time. Now let's talk about the other factor, trust. Right? So speed is already on the table. Now trust. How do we, how do we know that uh, that transaction can be used by someone in our own company? That person signing off on that report is not on my payroll. Why the hell should I trust them, right? They are just, they are just uh, uh, people out there that I don't know. But that's the point, right? In a, in, a, in, a, in a public environment, I'm just taking what's at the bottom and I'm expanding it up, all right? Just, just to give you an idea of what the consensus looks like. There's many types of consensus, but the main, purpose, the main purpose of it is to make it difficult. So not any one person is able to come in and sign off on a report, put it on the public ledger so that everybody can see. So what happens here? I'm, I'm just going to go through it. Um, in the case of Bitcoin, right, the, the far right, that's your gathering again. New transactions are being put into this empty box. And that box is labeled block number 203. That can be like your week 7 or week 8 reports. They're being filled up into this empty block. That empty block then gets moved over in front of this army of miners. I'm using Bitcoin as an example. But it could be miners, it could be a giant group that is randomly selected for consensus, like pulling out a committee to vote on the transactions. Everybody in the committee is responsible for making sure that the transactions are valid, that the source and the final uh, targets have enough value and things like that, right? This is, this is the purpose of the consensus mechanism. You hold someone responsible for signing. But the best part is you will never know who that someone is because it's decentralized. And the difficulty here is what makes it hard for people to break. So what's happening here? Every set of transactions will be locked down by a certain amount, a certain colored key. I'm using colors as an example, right? And each key to get the right color is an impossibly difficult mathematical formula. And that is why Bitcoin mining is so expensive. Everyone's trying to randomly generate these keys to see which key fits. And you have an entire army and millions around the world right now throwing keys at the solution constantly, right? And once one key locks um, the records up, that means they sign it off, right? They say, oh, we found the formula that matches and lets us put this block onto the public ledger. It is not easy, right? And when they finally solve it, they will then sign off add this block to the public domain and move on to the next block. So what's happening at this stage is that block has now joined the blocks that are published 
on the um, avail available to the public, and every block before it will be signed off twice. And then if you go this way, this block is now signed off three times. You notice that the number keeps going. And the further in the blocks are, maybe two or three deep, you know that that's not going to change anymore. That, that number is written in stone, right? So this is how, and of course, if you notice, there's a yellow key that pushes from each box. Every block has a value that is taken and added to the color of the next block. That is how we know that if someone gives you a fraudulent transaction somewhere in the history of the block, it will change the color of every block after it. So if someone tries to lie to you, you immediately know. This is um, a very good feature of blockchain, right? You will, you will always have revision control on your transactions. Right. So at this point, um, hang on. So what, what can you do uh, with this information? Right? You, you now have a locked record that's available to the public. And this record was signed off by someone not in your company, but also signed off by someone not in anyone's company, right? And it's available on the public domain. Anybody can go in and check the records. You won't know who, who each transaction belongs to, but if you have a, a uh, list of transactions that you've made between Alok dan Rakan Rakan, Basri and Co, right? When you apply it to the blockchain, you can pull a report. And let me pull this up next, right? So I, I'll touch very lightly on a public ledger, one of my uh, fellow panelists will go deeper later uh, on, 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 the, um, on how this can help an accounting uh, environment. If you look at the screen on top, uh, if you remove the middle section, right, that's going to be a typical uh, two entry ledger, right? You've got a lot of Rakan Rakan on one side, you've got Basri and Co on the other side. And basically, what's happening is each one of you holds a, a separate record, and you guys can check and counter check against each other. But you guys always need to get your 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 accountants. Oh, so I didn't I didn't I didn't realize that. <laughs> right? What happens in a blockchain environment is that <laughs> what happens in a blockchain environment is that you now have a basically a, a report system that allows uh, computers or AI to go in and pull the records for you. So that directly impacts your space. All right. All right. Sorry, I didn't see you just now. Um, and um, this is the uh, list of uh, companies that are active in this space right now. So to say that there is not much activity in blockchain space is not right. right? These are there's, there's industries in financial services, analytics, prediction, uh, data storage, everything. So these are all going to be opportunities where uh, expertise in this field will need to be applied. You know, while we say AI is coming in, but someone needs to guard the AI at the end of the day. Right. So thank you very much. I will be sure. Thank you very much. I think that was a good colleague that provided us with some uh, insights and so this is our speaker, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Vincent, we are and Mr. Connect to the Google Meet uh, for this 10 minutes uh, session with us. So, okay, so Mr. Vincent established Bigler Technology in Singapore since December 2001. Prior to embarking his entrepreneurship journey, he was attached to DBS Bank Limited in Singapore. So in 2019, Mr. Vincent attended MIT Sloan School of Management, covering blockchain technologies, business innovation and application, and the innovator's DNA, mastering the five skills of disruptive innovation. So Mr. Vincent is online now, and he will be sharing with us on the prospects of blockchain and the future of accountancy. So if I may pass the floor over to Mr. Vincent. Hi, Mr. Vincent. Hello. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Hello. Can you hear me? We can't seem to be able to hear you. Uh, I'm talking now. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, loud and clear. Good. Okay. Uh, so just uh, good morning, everybody, and I'm sorry that I missed the flight this morning. I'll just give a very uh, just a little bit of a background about myself. 
Um, I'm actually uh, electrical engineering by training. I uh, graduated from University of Manchester and uh, I did a signal processing in uh, uh, Cambridge University for my master's. After that, I used to work in a bank. Uh, that's where I learned a lot of the technology and uh, I've started three companies. Basically, Wavelet is uh, ERP accounting software and then followed by Big Ledger, which is uh, uh, to do with uh, cloud native applications, uh, big data, and so on. And SyncWave, which is a joint venture with SyncHing, which is a, um, uh, a company that focus on uh, technology for new retail, O2O, and, and so on. So I will proceed with the next slides. Um, <clears throat> so the next slides would be uh, why blockchain is important for audit. Now, we know that uh, all the account accountants uh, the auditors, they are, uh, they need to have a few assertions when they want to do the audit procedures. First of all, um, they need to make sure that the transaction and the events uh, fulfill a certain criteria. For example, the occurrence, <coughs> completeness, accuracy, uh, and so on. And when we look at the, the auditors checking at the end of the accounting period, uh, they, they always look at the balances and they look at the, in terms of the uh, presentation as well as the disclosure of the audit report. So to do all this, uh, as you have heard from Mr. Edgar just now, that uh, blockchain provides you the features and functions of uh, immutability and uh, uh, trustworthiness of, of the information and so on and so forth. Therefore, um, uh, when it comes to blockchain, uh, I would just like to highlight a few other features and characteristics that are important to make the blockchain uh, workable for audit as well as the accounting profession. Uh, first of all, the cost of verifications. Um, when we talk about cost of verifications, we talk about... Um, okay, I've, I've got a message to enlarge the slide a little bit, right? Is it better? Okay, so when it comes to um, the cost of verifications, we are talking about uh, auditors sometimes if they want to verify a, a record uh, at the end of the year, they need to verify with their uh, uh, account receiver, their, their vendor, they need to verify, verify the outstanding balance with their customers. Um, so I think this one is uh, uh, costing a lot of time, a lot of money. They need to count the running number, check out all, all the documents to to verify the uh, authenticity of the documents and, and so on. So uh, when it comes to um, blockchain for audit, it can tremendously uh, save time and effort in terms of verifying all the documents. Uh, apart from that, um, for blockchain, uh, the network effect the double standing spending problem, the consensus mechanism, the Im immutability, the smart contract, the private data, the continuous, uh, the that they don't have to do the blockchain like only end of the year. They can do the block, uh, they can do the audit throughout the entire year. They don't have to wait uh, till the, the only the peak season in April to to, to June. So um, when it comes to the um, blockchain for audit. Uh, if you look at the, each of the characteristics, like immutability, double spending problem, and all those, uh, uh, due to the short shortage of the time, I won't go into detail. I'll go to the next slide. Um, okay, the next question is, um, uh, when it comes to looking at the blockchain for audit, most of the time people will ask, what is, uh, how, how do I use a blockchain for audit? Is it just like uh, carrying out a transaction between two parties or three parties? Now, um, a very frequent term that you will encounter is actually the triple ledger accounting. So what is tri triple ledger accounting? Basically what we do is apart from the double entry in the accounting, uh, the debit and the credit of the uh, accounting, what we do is that we add another third entry and then we seal it with uh, the cryptographically seal, seal the transaction and then uh, 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 to, to, to like verify the transaction and then so that it cannot be changed anymore. If the if the record is being tampered, then uh, uh, third party will, will notice that uh, the, the record is tampered. So the auditor, they don't have to spend too much time doing the checking. Now, if you look at the triple entry within a company or external party, 
uh, from the business perspective, when you look at this diagram, there is uh, transactions, purchase, payment, sales, and reconciliation on the left-hand side. And then after that, you look at the ERP system where it, rec it records all the debit and the credit. And by use of a smart contract, which is a mechanism in blockchain to uh, uh, apply certain rules, um, let's say, for example, you want to debit credit something, but it exceeds the amount, or if you don't have a cash balance, then uh, uh, it becomes negative, then that, that uh, contract is, that transaction will be rejected. So the smart contract will determine the rules, and then uh, it goes into the blockchain ledger, and of course, it can be then summarized into different blockchain accounts for you to do the checking. So this is a very high overview of uh, how a blockchain could be implemented with the accounting system. Now, when it comes to um, implementation of the blockchain, one of the very uh, common things that people ask is that I don't want my accounting record to be available publicly. And uh, these are very sensitive transactions. So how do I protect it? So when it comes to uh, uh, the blockchain, actually uh, it is not everything public. That means that it is possible for you to actually keep certain things closed and certain things open. Now, the meaning of a, a public versus private is that whether who can write and who can read, uh, who can write uh, into the blockchain and the open and closed is versus who can read from the blockchain. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about all these uh, main concepts because once you have these concepts, you, you will be able to ask the right questions when you evaluate uh, whether it is suitable uh, for, for your usage. And uh, when you look at the characteristics and the properties of a blockchain, um, uh, you'll be able to uh, give your comments and raise your requirements. Uh, if you look at the economics of blockchain, this topic alone is uh, uh, um, uh, one or two weeks topic. But uh, uh, when we want to study whether a blockchain is suitable or not suitable, uh, you often see a lot of white papers in the internet uh, and everywhere. So most of the white papers, um, a lot of them fail actually is because they did not consider the economics of blockchain which is to take advantage of the cost of verification as well as the cost of networking of a blockchain. So, uh, and, and when it comes to the economics of blockchain, right? Uh, we know that uh, uh, when it comes to the cost of networking, we are talking about how different participants of the blockchain are working together to make sure that the transactions are valid. Now, in these slides, you see that they are uh, different types of consensus algorithm. So this consensus algorithm is actually the uh, it's like the it's like the rules where different chain uh, will agree with each other to 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 add a block to the ledger. So so this is like uh, uh, of course we don't have to go into, into details. And uh, uh, I will go to the next slide now. Another very important thing that uh, I, I, I believe that uh, anybody who look at blockchain, they need to be able to categorize the blockchain, whether they belong to the first, first generation. The first generation of a blockchain is like Bitcoin and Litecoin. And usually it focuses on the proof of work to, as a consensus algorithm. Um, and it has got very limited features and functions. And the second generation of the blockchain uh, which is Ethereum. It has got a smart contract uh, and it allows people to create their, their own currency, which is like, uh, sometimes we call it the tokenization of the blockchain. And then uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the third generation of the blockchain, uh, this one is actually still in development and it is much faster, it is more powerful. And of course, for the fourth generation of blockchain, which is also under development currently, uh, it is based on the SQL syntax and it, it is able to scale much bigger, faster. And um, if you talk about blockchain with the smart contract, uh, the rules, just like how everybody is participating in the Bitcoin world, whereby there are certain rules that they need to observe, it is also possible that we actually let the blockchain uh, eventually take over and run an, an organization with every uh, part of the governance, uh, every rules, the workflow, the, uh, 
the of, of, of the company and everything can be uh, can be managed and controlled so um, if you look at the components of a blockchain from the perspective of the accountant uh, I believe that uh, we need to look at these core components first of all when we talk talking about the ledger we need to decide uh, where the ledger is stored whether it's private public and then when you look at the smart contract component we are looking at uh, uh, what are the rules the workflow the audit procedure to to craft the smart contract and then we we have to look at the peer peer network and then uh, we have to look at who can participate in the blockchain which is the membership block and then we have to look at the events which actually create all the notifications that can be sent to various people we have to look at uh, who, who will be maintaining the system managing the system and whether there is a wallet to store the uh, uh, to store the value uh, so that uh, different participants in the system can pay make payment and also receive payment and then uh, we also look at the system integration with third party uh, the next slide is actually the actors in the blockchain so uh, when we look at the blockchain right a lot of people talk about blockchain, blockchain you always hear people talk about blockchain but the thing is that in order for a blockchain to work we actually need to have at least uh <coughs> six to seven different participants now as you can see from the slides we, we need to have people who design the blockchain we need to have the people who create the application based on the blockchain we need to have the people who maintain the blockchain we need to have the regulator the blockchain user and and so on and so forth the next slide we have uh, about a minute ago okay so very quick just uh, another two to three types okay so um the next part is that the accounting blockchain players as you can see from the screen uh they are like uh, these these are the players but i intentionally paste a, a news that uh, you can see on the left hand side here where some of these chains are actually closing down actually, unfortunately so uh, uh, i would say that uh, blockchain although it is going to be very important very popular and is coming soon but there are still a, 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 a lot of uh, industry players coming and leaving so uh, the next part that I want to say is that uh, uh, blockchain actually these days if you want to start a blockchain you, you just need to focus on the rules you actually don't need to get down into too, too technical because there are already cloud blockchain that you can just power up and use and then uh, 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 this slide is about the in the major industry players the banks and all that are supporting a open source blockchain project called the hyperledger so uh, this is good for enterprise for business and it, it can keep your data private so uh, uh, last but, but not, not least uh, is that um, uh, I'm, I'm very interested to uh, actually uh, develop an accounting blockchain blueprint uh, develop the syllabus and uh, uh, start some open source projects so if anybody who may be interested please take down my email and then uh, um, then after that we can discuss how how we may be able to start a project uh, with that, I end my uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. So, the opportunity to share how the contact will not be the of the service of the service of the service of the service of the the screen. So, next, um, we shall now uh, head on to our third speaker, Mr. Morley. So, Mr. Morley is an experienced digital transformation professional with extensive management consulting experiences across Australia, New Zealand, APEC, and USA. He is a certified Lean Six Sigma director, as well as a fellow of the Team of Public Accountants Australia. So Mr. Morley will cover on the readiness of accountants in this transformation, how can we kickstart with this transformation, as well as the skills uh, that the accountants need to uh, look forward and ensure we are equipped. So Mr. Really? Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, nice thing to come and speak to a university students. It's always a fun thing to do. Um, so my background a bit. So, uh, so I run the digital transformation agenda for the shared services here at Intel in Penang. Um, Prior to that, I worked with 
uh, EY and Accenture. So did 10 years of management consulting, which basically means do whatever your client needs you to do. Um, I'm a Lean Six Sigma black belt. So that's a process world. And I also have a, I'm an accounting fellow. And I also have a master's in information systems and bachelor's in accounting and finance. So that's my background. Um, so I wanted to start off. So I think I have the easy job. This guy had to speak a bit technical on blockchain and stuff. So mine's a bit easy. So trying to speak about what are the future skill sets that you guys need to start adapting to so that become more employable, right? That's what we're all more interested in, become more employable, become, um, I think, more relevant to the future market, right? So I start, I start off with this. There's a body called a Society of Human Resource Management, and they put out this um, skill sets, right? So 2019 state of the workplace. So I'm going to go through a few of it. So what they say is 37%, I'll just skip down to all of it. So these are the skill sets, as they say, that is missing in the workforce currently, right? So problem solving, critical thinking, innovation, creativity is quite high. Next is ability to deal with complexity, ambiguity, and communication. So if you see the top three, that makes up like quite a bit of what is missing in the workforce. What we're talking today, blockchain, AI, robotics, all this stuff, it's a tool that you use, but these are skills that you need to deploy those tools, right? So next bit I want to talk about, so science, engineering, medical. So I think the last three, you get a bit more technical skill. The first three is about more soft skills. So here we talk about, so this is more relevant to accounting space. And this is from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, England and Wales, and ICAW. So what they say is core skills required for the future. Five of them. So again, data is very big on it. So data intuition skills. So we talk about blockchain and stuff. Everything's related back to data. Without good data skills, you can't really operate a technology like blockchain. So you need basic understanding of the technology, but a very good understanding of data. Next, you talk about programming tools and languages. So it's no longer a world where I'm an accountant, that's IT's job. We live in a world where you need to understand both sides of the coin, right? Uh, data communication, visualization, data wrangling. So if you see three out of the five skills put up by ICEW is related to data, right? And the last one is business partnering. So back to soft skills. So I wanted to kick off with this, but so what do you guys think is the key messages? So I was planning of a more interactive session, not of a talk. So feel free to respond, please. I'll be alone up here. <laughs> All right. So what do you guys think the key messages are? I'm going to start pointing after this. Sorry? IT and data, yep. What else? I hear crickets. All right, let's move on. All right, so for me, what I find from this is one technical skill is not good enough. We all traditionally, you grow up, you're like, okay, I'm an accountant, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm an engineer, whatever, right? That is not going to be good enough in the future world. We will have multiple roles and we will do multiple things. You can't be in the workforce and say, I do this alone, you will be fired really quick. Right? You need to be very diverse in your skill set and you need to adapt really quick. The next bit is, so once you focus on the technical, the next thing is the technical know-how alone will not get you where you're going, right? You'll be good at what you do, but I don't think you will grow a lot. So focus on building your soft skills, which goes back, right? We talked a lot about one of the top missing skills is communication, collaboration, business partnering, all this stuff. So if you're an accountant, you can't say, I come nine to five, I work in my silo, I do my things, I go home. It won't work, right? You need to cross collaborate. You need to work with an engineer, understand. How can I help you to do your job better? I need to understand what you do for me to do that, right? If you're a, if you're like an IT person, you can't just say, I come here, I operate this server, I go home, right? You need to be able to understand what your customer demands are, what their requirements are, and serve them accordingly, right? So it's going to be a workforce where your skills are going to be 
really diverse. Number one. Number two is you need to work with people to be able to use those skills. And number three is problems will become more complex. Right? You can't do it alone, which is where your collaboration skill comes in. The problems that we faced in the past, like twenty years, will look very simple compared to what we're going to face in the next twenty years. Technology is moving much faster. The world's changing much faster. Everyone's becoming, um, I think, more savvy in a lot of areas, right? So we'll come up with a lot of uh, different sets of problems will be harder to solve. So you need more great minds to work together to try and solve it. All right. So how do you get started? So that was one of the questions, like preparing yourself for the future, right? How do you get started? So when I was in college, a uh, lecturer of mine told me, he said on the first day of his class, he told he said. There are some students who are like a mop. There are some students who are like a bucket. Right? I looked at him the way you guys are looking at me now. <laughs> <laughs> so what he said is a mop is uh, so he started with a bucket first, right? A bucket is a fixed thing, right? You can only pour a certain amount of water in it, and that's it. It's done. After that, it starts spilling over. I can't take any more in. Versus a mop goes around just absorbing whatever you can find. You start absorbing it. Right, what it is. So, in more professional terms, call it a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Right. So, you need to adapt to have a growth mindset. What you're learning today, it doesn't end. Right. So, it doesn't mean that you're done with the MBA. I'm like, good, done. Take that box. No, you got to like, what's the next thing to learn? So, it's a continuous learning journey. Right. And the other bit is like, be a learn it all versus a know it all. Right. So, you'll find like sometimes in some areas or some people are like, no, I've been here for 20 years. I know everything. You listen to me. The world of the future is not going to work that way because people are going to learn at a much faster rate. Learning is very open now. So you've got to be learn, right? Learn from one another, learn from other resources. And that's where the collaboration piece comes in again, right? It can't be about what I know. It's about what we know. How do we work together to solve a problem? Um, the next bit is, so I talk a lot about learning. So I think the next real key is learn. Keep Continuous learning, right? Keep learning all the time. And I think learning doesn't mean you go to school or you go for a training or you come to a talk like this. Not that I'm not happy to have you guys here. Uh, but I think it's more about using all resources available to you. So one of the top resources I use to learn is YouTube, right? Free, available. And like all the stuff we're talking about today about blockchain, you'll find like tons of video on that, right? So we just do a Google search. Very simple, right? Google's like a next top thing that you learn. LinkedIn articles. So just quick reading, right? But this is how you keep current, keep abreast with what's going on. Next, once you learn, you have to practice. It's not about just learning theory sometimes. You've got to go and do it. Right? So you can read all about soccer, but you need to go and play to understand how the game works. Right? So you really need to practice. Keep practicing your skill. Then you grow some more, right? And next, the easiest way to both learn and practice is to teach, right? So again, teach, I don't mean go and become a teacher or a lecturer or a professor, right? I mean, go teach someone else. You learn something new, go and talk to someone about it, and then you're teaching them about it. So get them to understand what this new thing is about. And by you explaining to them, they'll ask you something and you go and learn some more, right? So it's a continuous process that you keep evolving. The last thing probably is try different jobs and roles. So going back to you're no longer going to be a single track person of the future, right? You have to try different things. And that involves taking a bit of risk, right? It's always scary when you try to change something or take risk, but you got to go try it. If you don't try, you don't know. Sitting from the edge or outside perspective, you'll never get it. So different jobs, different roles, even within your organization or across different organizations, right? Be flexible. Don't limit yourself as, I can only do this. Sometimes it's about, you got to jump in the deep end to learn how to swim. You can't stay on the shore and say, how do I do this? How do I do this? Right? Understand next generation trend. Be an early adopter. Right? So here, we're, today, we're talking about blockchain, which is something that's been around for a few years, right? Uh, we talk a lot about robotics. We talk a lot about artificial intelligence. So all this stuff is current. 
Five years ago, the topic was something else. Ten years ago, the topic was something else. So you can guarantee five years from now, we wouldn't be talking about the same thing we're talking today. So you've got to start looking out about what the next thing is and start learning early, right? Be an early adopter, go and try it and learn it, practice, teach, and keep doing that cycle. But you've got to do it continuously throughout. It's not a one-off thing. So with that, I end the points I had, but I want to do more of a Q&A. I better not hear crickets this time, I hope. Uh, but yeah, I think the other way to learn, right? Ask, or you stay silent and you lose out. If someone drops a pin, I all can hear it. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, you wanted to ask a question. So, yeah. Uh, we will. You want to answer answer a question or ask a question? So, uh, we we plan to uh, deal with the uh, question and answer during the forum uh, later on. So you're gonna hold your thought. <laughs> so right. there's a, a slip in the feedback. All right, cool. With that, I think I'll probably end. We'll take some time back. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting uh, UI uh, and for myself as a rep. Maybe just a background. Uh, today, the topic, I know it's blockchain, but you talk about transforming the accountancy profession. May I just see a show of hands? How many people here are non-technology people? Majority of you, is it? Okay, cool. Accountants or business and... Okay, so um, my background, I'm actually first, although you see ASEAN technology risk and then risk, right? I told Prof, actually I said, Prof, I started as Bachelor of Accounting. <laughs> okay, so I'm a living example of the learning and the relearning uh, that Murali talks about. Um, I started my career um, in uh, doing, so I'm a CA and a CPA. Uh, and I started my specialization when I became a partner uh, in a firm going into governance, risk and compliance. And then I further uh, specialized in technology. So, uh, so I am a licensed uh, MOF uh, <laughs> can sign accounts. I'm also a licensed by MCMC as one of the rare digital signature auditor. So when you talk about later on all those that talks about the tokens, uh, there needs to be trust <laughs> mentioned. Uh, I'm one of the certified people in Malaysia uh, to sign on those reports authorized by the ministry. Uh, and my role has also evolved. Okay, I started in the assurance practice, then I went in into the risk area. So what I take care of today is uh, process governance technology risk. And in EY, other as a line partner, I take care of all the IT spend. Every IT spend in uh, EY has to go through me. Uh, so I'm actually an acting CIO as well. Okay. So today I just want to share with you all uh, on the areas. I just want to do a take five because the three speakers uh, have actually summarized things. Now, take five, the purpose. Is blockchain um, something that's going to stay? I think it will. If you look at the prediction, uh, our leader in EY talks about by 2030, we think that perhaps 50% of certain things will be running on blockchain. Okay? So we just have to watch 11 years from now. Okay? It is a secure, sensitive information through immutability, as mentioned by uh, Vincent just now. It's because the way it's designed. Okay? 
Second is, if you think of the function, just think of it like today, I mean, my, my research team shared with me, it's just a string of pearls. You know, pearls, one by one by one. Okay, so those transactions are a string of pearls. And how is it linked? It talks about from cryptography, the hashes. So the hashes are basically, it will make it more secure because once it's done, you cannot reverse. Okay, it's not like a debit credit. Oh, you wrongly classify, let's take it out and whatever. So it goes through that, that's the situation. Second, just to uh, the accessibility. When, when you evaluate, if you are, you know, depending on, on your posture, whether you're working in professional accounting like us, serving clients, or if you're in a corporation, that your organization will participate maybe in a blockchain uh, in order to do transactions. There are public and private domains. Okay, so you hear some of the words on the, you know, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Neo, and we talk about the fourth generation, fifth generation coming. So if you look at it as a technology, it's still developing. But has certain things gone live? The answer is yes. Okay, but we need to keep track of it. So one thing about the sustainability of our blockchain, um, my my reading is there will be many blockchains, but not everyone will be successful because you might not have the critical mass, you might not have the economics to sustain, but there will be some who will take off. Okay. Uh, in terms of sector, so don't think it is just financial institution, it's sector neutral. Okay. Because you can do it from FNB, you talk about healthcare, you can talk about agriculture. Okay. If some of you look at my LinkedIn, uh, 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 um, posting today. Uh, EY, very fresh, just two weeks ago, uh, we were doing with a wine company. That's how they did all the traceability in overseas, okay? Uh, basically, okay? The other point is it has to be regulated, okay? Just now, we talk about it being a system of trust. Trust means everyone is using it. If you look at it just now, if someone mentioned about the actors, Okay, there's many players, okay? And there are three things in there, tokens, okay? Second is the contract. Number three, that is payments. So with this ecosystem of things, it's generally is regulated. So does Malaysia have a regulation? Yes, it's in Securities Commission guidelines. There are eight key things to talk about. If you want to build a blockchain, there are some certain conditions. There are currently three conditional approval given okay, for them to meet. And so this is some of the things. If someone wants to start a blockchain, please remember there is guidelines, okay? And if that someone is doing something that's unauthorized, uh, Minister of Finance in a public notice has mentioned, there is penalty. It's 10-10. 10, 10. 10 million, 10 years in jail. Okay, so I just mentioned, if you look at the blockchain global spending, uh, as determined by the various factors. It's a big market, 9.7 billion, okay? And what are the sectors affected by blockchain if you look at it? From banking and SMEs, okay? In rental or right sharing, real estate, F&B, education and supply chain. So when I mention sector neutral, this is what it means. Second, now accountants, <laughs> okay? This is a EY survey that we did probably late 2017. So you look at it, the statistics, statistics today, we do it, I think will change, but it will not change much. Um, and 150 ASEAN-based accounting and finance professional were asked, okay, uh, what were your uh, evolving skill sets and where's the top inhibitors? I think it talks about lack of time, <laughs> lack of financial resource, okay? Uh, employer support, uh, not sure if skills it will be beneficial, not sure what are the causes and self-motivation. I think this has to go away. Lah, huh? If you have to, if you're working in an organization, if your organization is going to look at some of this technology in order to run the business, I think every one of us, if you're working in that organization, you have to raise the game and, you know, to put aside time to make sure you focus on the new thing. And what you do maybe routinely, you have to think of it more effective and efficient ways to do it. And that's the other digital transformation things like why RPA came in, robotic process automation, why AI, why machine learning are kicking in, and why people are using more data driven so that they can write rules to have things that is what's 
clean, goes through what's exception reporting data analytics to help you manage your business. So, so as accountants, as maybe your business, maybe your uh, engineer looking into some business areas, whatever it is, I think the idea is we have to raise the game as we have to unlearn, relearn to be relevant. Okay. Now, how does blockchain impact the landscape of accountancy? What will be transformed? Number one, if you look at it, the transactional assurance. I think someone mentioned about that because there's lots of data. The way you're going to audit or the way you're going to look at things will be very different. Okay, it's very data driven. Second, the transfer of property rights. Okay, as in because there's a contract happening, then what is your, you know, accountants love to tell, oh, what is the revenue recognition uh, for all this? Okay, you need to think a lot at some of these and see when the settlement comes in. Now, if you take a step back today, Many years ago, we walk into the bank to take money. Today, ATM will do online transfer, right? We have evolved, but everyone knows how to do it. Second, we all pay things through cash. Today, you go to some little shops, we are paying through e-wallets, right? So it will come. So we just have to adapt. Second, what are the improvements? So the auditors, uh, the accountants, and the regulators will be able to check transactions in real time with certainty and when that comes in the regulators are going to be more demanding and the regulators are not only who regulates uh, the tax guys are also regulators uh, they were chased so that's why digital tax right they were saying hey you have the data what well, continuously well. so no need to be six months from now only you file your returns you know i can come in and take a look and let's see what it is because you're paying your sst every month okay so that's one thing Second, little need to confirm the accuracy with external sources because if everyone is in the ecosystem, that would mean the transactions are hitting various people. That's why just now you hear about the triple ledger accounting, right? In a way, if I buy from you, it's either my cash went out, your cash went in, and then, you know, how it knocks off and then where does it get paid to? So if it's all captured in the ecosystem, Technically, your reconciliation, your provenance assurance will be reduced or eliminated. Okay, so things like you spend a lot of time today, five, ten people doing recon, recon here, recon there, they will cut down, huh? So maybe deploy the people to do something slightly different. Okay, the other bit is combined with uh, you know, especially on dispute management. Some of you do interco, right, in your organization. Sometimes you also have got third party. Spend a lot of time dispute management. Chances is, when you go on a blockchain, number one, time step. Number two, cannot reverse. Number three, all these things matches. What is there to argue? Okay. Then the certainty around the rights and obligation will be very clear. Okay. Then the other thing is how do you account and expansion of what you should be. Now, what about accountants? So please don't underestimate. Accountants, you are the most important. Because everything you do, on this will have some business or financial implication. So you're going to be the bridge between your technologies and business stakeholders. So if you're going to explore whether it's RPA, whether it's blockchain in your organization, just now there was some checklist to say you need to spot what are the things. So you need to do your little due diligence, right? In order to say, hey, we're going to this public web and how does it take care of user access? How do, you know, how do I know it's secure? How does I know my information is not going to be leaked out, right? Or, or, or my key things. So please, sometimes on the technology aspect of that, please rope in your IT guys, your sec IT security guys to be part of it. If you've got certain business end users and they want to do this, please rope them in. So it has to be a collective group to look at it together. Okay. Uh, last but not least, okay, as accountants, you can also position yourself as key advisors on the system too other organization or user organization. So when we talk about blockchain, so people like us in, in EY, some of our clients actually have got a platform that's shared by everyone. So they are called a service organization. And a lot of people are using, it's called a user organization. So what do they have to give in the order of trust to these people? The professional accounting firm like us are the ones that do you know, like they say audit, but this time it's not true and fair view on a financial statement, but it's true and fair view into that platform and we call it SOC report, service organizational control report. Some of you are in the multinationals, you probably understand that.
because some of you already outsource certain payroll, right? And sometimes your auditors say, show me your soccer report or your SOC report on whoever does that. So it's more or less the same concept. Okay, so now in, in short, what are the skills demand by 2022? The ones on the left is going to be reduced. The ones on the right are where you need to think, which is analytical. You need to think about innovation, uh, creativity, originality, initiative, technology, design, and programming, complex problem solving. And I think last but not least, for them, some of you, it's also the leadership as a social influence. Because if you are going to be one of the pioneers in your organization, to drive some of this innovation. You do need champions. And so you do need to bring along the rest of the people in your organization to move up that curve. Okay. So uh, as a closing, I just want to mention that at the end of the day, what are the point of view from Ernst and Young's perspective is the sensitive information can be better leveraged. And a lot of it, if you look at it, all these transactions are all data, right? So the data security across the accounting pro processes must be in place. Okay. Second thing, with the gradual adoption of some of these, uh, even firms like ours in EY, okay, we are stepping up because I've got we've got clients who might be participants. We've got clients who might be offering this as a service. Number three, we are also advising clients to build this, okay, because we've got our advisory practices. We are also stepping up our blockchain auditing advisory services and we've got something called mm. uh, the blockchain uh, analyzer that looks at some of these. And when we actually help build some of these for some of the clients who is doing all this traceability, we've actually launched something called EY uh, Ops Chain on, on, on some of these. And you know, get, we, we get trained. Okay, That was why we've got internal badges uh, certification in our organization. Okay. And uh, with cybercrime, right, we hear cybercrime, people get ransomware and all those kind of stuff. So the, the blockchain temper-proof nature will be increasingly useful to mitigate some of this risk. And I believe, uh, you know, as a practitioner, we believe that uh, it can, this will be some of the platform if it's built well, that people are moving because it can mitigate the risk of data uh, uh, falsification. So in short, uh, that's uh, the summary from uh, myself. Uh, and later on, we'll be happy to take any questions. So if you've got any questions, uh, QR code is there on some of the EY blockchain stuff that you can take a look free. Okay. And if there's any questions, uh, you can address this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, we now will take uh, about a couple of uh, one minute break in which you can actually uh, write down your question in the little sheet of paper that you can find in the blue bag. Yeah. <clears throat> so the committee members will uh, go around and collect this question. And moving on, we are entering into our group panel discussion and the question and answer. So um, it's okay, please be seated because uh, I'm going to start uh, the ball rolling. So while waiting for the collection of questions from our audience, uh, please allow me to start and uh, pose the first question to our panel speakers. Yeah, let's hear from our panel speakers what's their opinion on this. Okay, so my dear panel speakers, the first question that I would like to put up for discussion is this. Okay, Brock, and before that, Mr. Vincent, uh, are you in already? Just a minute. Yes, yes, I'm in. Okay, great. The very first question of discussions are waiting for the questions to be collected is this. Blockchain has fast risen from an emerging trend to a disruptor in the businesses across industries. But can it really address the challenges we are facing in accounting? So the hundred million dollar question is, is blockchain just a hype or so let's hear from our panel speakers who would like to take first. Is blockchain a high or a So uh, maybe out of the whole panel, I probably have the easiest answer for this one. <laughs> it's a, if it's a false, I mean, wrong job, right? <laughs> so I'm uh, sorry, yeah. So, 
So, no, it's, it's definitely here to stay. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, uh, Anyone else? yeah. Yeah, I, 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 can, uh, I can say something. Hello? Sure, Vincent. Okay. <clears throat> So if you look at the internet technology from the 1990s, I still remember I, when I was in um, uh, using the Dow up more then. Um, until today, we see that, and, and of course the dot-com bubble and all that, uh, you can see that uh, Malaysia, uh, Lazada, only like um, not that many years ago, Lazada uh, started becoming uh, popular in Malaysia, the e-commerce and stuff. So I think uh, blockchain is also going through the hype cycle currently, whereby it was overhyped for a while, then until a stage where it actually, uh, uh, everybody start hearing about it, talking about it, and then uh, um, it will take a little bit of time like uh, to, to get people to actually develop something really useful on, on it. So uh, uh, in my opinion, I think blockchain is a hope rather than a hype, but it's just that uh, it, has, it hasn't reached the maturity stage at the moment. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Morani, what do you have on this? Uh, yeah, so I agree. It's something. Okay, so, so one thing they say about blockchain is like, blockchain or Bluetooth transactions like the internet has done for communications. So internet changed the way we communicate with everyone. Right? I have then it's like, we have write letters, a phone call, right? Now with the internet, it's much easier, right? And it transforms a lot of things. You now have social media, right? Very big. Facebook launched in 2006. We're now, what, 14 years later, 13 years later. It's so big, right? Like, you, you rarely find someone who doesn't use it Instagram. Uh, all this stuff, right? So it's changed the way we communicate. So blockchain will do that for, it will enable a lot of applications for transactions. But like we said, it's going to take some time. Sure, thanks. Yes. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's also, uh, it will come to stay, but I believe that it cannot have a very, the people who operate it will need to find a good business case to sustain it. Okay, it must have users. So if people don't believe in it, then people die. <laughs> but if people use it, but there cannot be too many players, okay, that, that will spread that. So I, I believe there will be some survivors and there will be some which will die off. But I think it's it. Sure, thank you very much for the opinion uh, received from our panel speakers. So it is a hype, or it has been a hype, but there's definitely a great hope from it. Particularly, we can see the business value that blockchain is capable to driving this. So I can see that we have received quite a number of questions. Now, if I may have the questions from the committee, please. Okay, well, uh, they're trying to start up uh, probably some categorization of um, the related topics and the speaker that the questions are being addressed to. Well, <clears throat> if I may pose another question to our panel of speaker here. Many of you just now have talked about how much we should uh, relearn, retool, reskill ourselves as a in order to write on these challenges that blockchain has posted. Uh, in our capacity as an accountant, as also in other business players in our respective organizations. So, guys, um, well, while blockchain is no doubt a disruptive technology, but the critical questions that we ask ourselves if we are under employment is do you think that blockchain will totally eliminate accountants? Because things have been able to be done powered by the AI and automation, and will it totally eliminate accountants? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so. <laughs> No, no, I, I don't think so. Not, not, or at least not accountants as as you define them today, right? This this field is we have not done with this field yet. So, if you imagine that in the future you have blockchain replacing how easy it is uh, for accountancy to work, there's still going to be need for implementation. This was brought up by Mr. Morali earlier. This is a very good point that you still need the subject matter experts for implementation as before. And then after you still need those people to keep the systems honest, right? You are, you are still going to have accountants come into the field uh, to make sure that the systems we have implemented 
we are not going to let the AI run everything, right? <laughs> Obviously, we are not going to let computers run everything. We still need to have the people who understand how it works to check the system. And as we have more capability during the uh, uh, process of uh, running blockchains, and that is big analytics. If you don't have people that understand the space on how companies work and how companies transact, um, what's the point of you know putting all the data out there? So no, there is no lack of uh, space for uh, countless growing tools. I'm pretty sure that you guys will find a niche for yourself, or it won't be a niche in the future. It's a niche today, but these are going to be big um, things to look into in the future. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mr. Steve, would you like to say something? Uh, sorry, Mr. Would you like to say something? It's okay. Uh, what about Mr. Mamani? Yeah, so uh, the way I look at this is I think how we define encounters to be is something that has been constant for a while. Right? So how we define it would be what you learn for what the professional body tells us what an encounter is. So my analogy I draw is like a doctor. Right? So there's a doctor. Doctors are a profession that's lasted for a very long time. But doctors constantly change, right? As as we change our lifestyle, we change um, our diet habits, we change what we do, we change we change a lot of stuff, right? There's new diseases, all these things come about, new medication. And doctors have to do new things as well. It's not what's become that we done, right? So a doctor five years ago is different from a doctor now. It's evolved, but yet the title remains, it's a doctor. So think about it that way, an accountant it is. We have been constant for a while, I would say, what we did, but in the future is we've got to change it, right? And I think a few elements got to work together with that. It's like professional bodies got to change what they define an accountant as. And universities or higher learning centers have to change that as well. What we teach for future companies based on the trends that are coming in the future. Um, I have a suggestion. Um, hello? Yes, uh, Vincent, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, actually there are a lot of blockchain courses online uh, on the internet, but the, th but the thing is that uh, some of the accountants, maybe when they hear the word blockchain, they think that it is too technical and they get scared off. So um, I just want to say that uh, uh, there are actually a lot of courses that are for accountants, for business people as well. So not everything in blockchain is about all the cryptography, you know, very technical stuff. Uh, some of it is looking at the economics of blockchain, the usage, the applications of a blockchain, etc. So um, I do encourage um, everyone in the room to actually take up some of these courses. Uh, and you can it's, it's actually can be quite cheap like 10 uh, 100 us dollar 50 us dollar you can take the whole course you know complete with certification and so on so um yeah uh, do continue uh, explore the, the the accounting blockchain for non technical people online uh, I think with digital technology I don't think that definitely accounting profession will not go away. But what will change will be the nature of the job. Okay. So if you stay stagnant and think that as an accountant you are just a bookkeeper, then that will be a problem. Second, it's uh, a lot of things will be digitalized. As you know today, some of your uh, areas of things are already digitalized. Second, then um, don't get worried, I would say, over what technology will come. Today is called blockchain, tomorrow that becomes something. Okay, then you, suddenly you have got rather than human being, you have got suddenly you got RPA. Okay, so at the end of the day, like I mentioned, every transaction will eventually end up with some business and financial implications. Who is authorized to look at that? It's people who are trained as accountants. You are certified for certain reasons, you have got your value, but the way maybe you do certain of the parts of technology elements. And you just need to embrace that. Yeah, and one more thing that we didn't really talk about is you know, we, we didn't we didn't talk about public uh, ledger, but in, in blockchain there's also uh, public and private blockchains, and they also have a future in 
uh, you know, in, in the space. And large companies also engage in private blockchain enterprises, and that is also an area where you know your expertise can come in very handy. So it's not, not just because it's a public budget, you're out of the picture. There is actually a lot of space, uh, spaces coming up that this uh, knowledge will be very useful. Sure. So thank you very much. We will move now. Uh, at the best, we have received uh, quite a big stack of papers or questions from the audience. So we will try our best uh, within the time frame to address um, to all these questions that we have received here. So there are some questions that address the speakers, but some questions are general. Um, well, some of the questions are kind of related, so we will probably uh, just take according to the one that we see. The first question is actually addressed to Mr. Edgar, yeah, from uh, Mr. Sima. What is the security or risk that we have if we are going to 4.0 industrial technology? Well, um, we, we can go into, go into extreme fear uh, state or we can, we can just deal with uh, how it could look like, right? When you say the 3.4.0, obviously a lot of people think AI and, and, and AI is coming to this, things like that. But uh, it, it's true that one of the, the key areas of risk is that if, if you see how we program AI today, in the old days, when, when you write a program, right, you're going to know how that program is going to work. In the world of neural networks, for example, you don't write the program itself. You write a program that defines how the neural networks will work, and then those neural networks that does the job for you will be retained, and those that don't will be eliminated. But what happens at the end of the day is that you might have certain algorithms running that are working for us, but we don't understand how they work. Uh, we don't, like if I would take a phone today, um, I know, I'm pretty certain that I can find someone on the planet who can explain every component of the phone to me. But in the, in the case of AI and, and the way that it's developed, we might actually come to a point where uh, we know how we define the programs that generate the algorithms, but we don't know specifically how the algorithms work themselves. Right? And that is why when we're talking about Industry 4.0, we still need to have checkers, like real human checkers to pay attention to how the systems are behaving, right? Uh, because we're just generating systems that push it out the algorithms for us. There's still that we need for subject matter experts to pay attention to see if they're starting to act uh, funny, right? So that's one, one risk that I can think of after that. Thank you, Mr. Well, we have another related uh, question whereby uh, we are asked, asked what are the steps taken by blockchain to have better securities? Because that's about um, 1,315 million US dollars were lost in one case recently. So I open this uh, answer to the panel of speakers. It's related to the, how, what are the steps taken by blockchain to have a better security? Okay, I think there's a disconnect here between um, the, the security of blockchain and the. Uh, if I speak, can you hear me when I sit up? So there's a disconnect uh, here in understanding how these big dollars are lost in the uh, blockchain space. The blockchain itself may not be the failure, or usually it's not the failure, right? The failure here is that we have accounts in the uh, exchanges or in, or in uh, websites or whatever, where we store our crypto. And what's happening in this case is not the blockchain that is failing, but it is the security implemented in these exchanges or services that have failed. And, you know, it, it's akin to, you can't hack an email, right? But you can hack Gmail or something, you can figure out somebody's Gmail account password and go in and do stuff. So in the cases of most of these hacks, it is or, or losses, it's going to be that these, the exchange was uh, was put at risk. The, the blockchain itself, in its current state, um, if it's like one of the larger uh, blockchains that has sufficient um, hashing power behind it, it is so far not broken. Or it, if you ever prove that you can break a blockchain, 
then I think everybody in this space is in trouble. It is um, sufficiently secure in itself. So no, the, the, the question needs to be rephrased, right? How do exchanges and um, all these uh, companies that offer services protect their customers' account from being um, at risk rather than blockchain itself? Because the technology of blockchain itself is rather secure. Thank you for the view, Mr. Edna. And uh, I have a few questions here that are addressed to Mr. Brody and Mr. Zana as well. So, the first question to Mr. Morelli is, what do you think of building a business in blockchain? Building a business in blockchain, I think, so I think one thing we have to be clear, right? Blockchain is the technology. You've got to figure out what is the application that you want to use it for, right? So it's like saying, either you can't say you want to build a car, you want to say I'll run a taxi business. Right? So figure out what your application is. And then you do the usual, right? When you're starting to try a business, it's like what's the business case for your product? How are you going to go and sell it? What's the market available? And then how much risk appetite you have. So I think I'm not that right. Figure out how you want to apply this technology in that space. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rowley. The next question is also addressed to you from uh, Ms. Josephine. How can organizations which have different generations of workers handle the adoption of new trends and digital transformation like blockchain? So I think every organization handles it differently. Uh, so agree you have a variety of workforce, right? Uh, sorry, a variety of groups in your workforce. Uh, I think a lot of it is got to do with organization culture. So how the organization sells continuous learning to their employees, right? How much focus they put on that. So I think a good organization that wants to survive long term focuses a lot of this. You gotta you gotta constantly train your employees, you gotta retrain, reinvent, give them space to learn and try. So that like Organizations that will survive in the long term. Like you know this, right? A lot of organizations that existed 50 years ago don't exist today. Right? Some die, some thrive. So the ones that thrive focus a lot on employee learning and reinventing them and then keep continuing with the trend. And I think the other thing really comes down to is like it's it's in you, right? Like you don't you shouldn't be hoping and waiting for someone to come and tell you or teach you, you got to go out and seek the knowledge and learn. So a lot of it is personal motivation. How motivated am I to learn? That's what it is. Now you guys are all here, right? So when you leave school, it's not just about learning, you just got to continue learning. And learning doesn't have to be specific on topics, right? Learning can be anything. It's just knowledge in general. You just got to look at the knowledge. No one's going to come and force feed or school feed you in the future. Thank you, Mr. Morley. There are a couple of related questions uh, received here, uh, which is also, which I also addressed to you. So they are essentially related to the skills uh, needed. So the first question here is, as a normal employee, how much do we need to improve to reach the soft skill and blockchain level for an advanced economy? And the second related Sorry, question is, normal employee. As a normal employee, <laughs> how much do we need to improve to reach yes, this office The other one related to it is what does the specific IT skills, uh, what are the specific IT skills that accountants need to adapt? And the other related one is that on the core skills for digital future, do accountants have to learn programming languages? If yes, what are the examples we can start with? And uh, yeah, that's about the skills for now. I'll try to answer in sequence, but remind me if I forget. Um, so the first bit, I'm not sure what a normal employee is. I think we are all normal. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, uh, so if I rephrase that, sorry, as an employee, what are the... Do you want to just do it? Yeah. So how much do I need to improve uh, soft skill and blockchain level of advanced economy? All right. So 
I, I don't think you can measure this. I don't think it goes back to that theory, right? I don't think there's a limit on how much you can learn or improve. There isn't a cap, right? You can keep doing it continuously, like the sky's the limit, right? There's, there's just no limit of how much you can do. So I think it's more about trying to figure out so everyone's economy all that stuff. So some of the things are really outside the control, but the impact on the economy you live in, the country that you live in, all this stuff, right? But how much is it to improve? I think there is no limit. You just gotta figure out and keep doing it constantly. Right? Hello, I have some uh, something to add to this. Hello. Hello? Right, uh, I've got one more here. Core skills of digital programming language. So, again, you don't have to do anything, right? You can just go home and sit there and do nothing. <laughs> but if you want to survive and try, you got to go and learn it, right? So, programming is one of the fun, right? So, I've got my guys in a in our team, where they're doing that, they're accountants, but they're learning a lot of programming languages. They sit there and program. And it doesn't have to be super complex things, right? Start small, right? But just go and learn. And all the resources are available free, right? There's a lot of blogs, that personal interest, so many like videos, watch it and they learn it. And they start with like little things, right? They're like, oh, I do this repetitive thing every day. How can I automate it? How do I write a simple macro? Again, when I mean macro, I don't mean Excel. Right, like an automated program to automate this piece of manual load that's been done the same way for the past 10 years. Right, so a guy comes in there, he figures it out, and he starts writing it, codes it, and then puts it in production, and then bam, all right, go to the next thing. So you're gonna have a bit of passion, you're gonna have a bit of interest, but maybe again that learning, right? And programming language, there's so many, right? Like, so you can learn multiple things, and different have different ones have different applications as well. So even if you want to be good in the data space, programming is a very critical skill set that you need as well. Uh, so examples that come and start with elaborate on business partnering. So business partnering is a concept where, like I said, right, you're an accountant. It doesn't mean nine to five, you come, you sit in your desk, do your little accounts and you go home. Right? Business partnering is so like I said, you gotta work with other People in the business, we can't think of ourselves, I'm finance, your engineering, your IT. It's about your HR, whatever, right? Whatever the field is. You gotta figure out, okay, what what does this person mean? How do we every organization work towards a goal? If only my my Intel has 110,000 people, only 110,000 people are aligned to that one goal and you move forward as a company. Right? So any company, even if it's a 50 people company, if 50 people are moving in different directions, you will never step forward. So business partnering is about everyone aligned to one goal. How do I make that goal work for you? So as an accountant, it shouldn't be, this is what I say, this is the policy, this is how it's going to work. It should be more about what, are, what is the business objective we're trying to achieve? How do we partner to make that work? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, one, one good point that, that, that the programming question brought up is that yes, it, it is definitely a worthwhile skill to have. 
Uh, because one thing that we didn't really elaborate on in the public space is that uh, the concept of smart contracts. Right? Smart contracts allows us to uh, put language or parameters into the transactions that we are doing. So all those transactions that are cycling every five or ten seconds or whatever, we can add in requirements like you know, uh, time to kill date or uh, it must execute if A and B happens. These are things that you can actually put into the transaction itself. And this is going to be the core of what runs a lot of these uh, transactions in an industry 4.0 environment. Because we can set up the rules, but it has to be built in. And no better person would be uh, in a place to put in these rules than the people who understand how they themselves, right? So they, they can build around it. And I think that's one of the big things that you might not consider looking at. Right, how smart contracts are going to work because it's going to be a key feature of the blockchain space. Because, uh, yeah, if we move on, we have received a number of as well. The first one is from Gore. Uh, the question is why blockchain cannot reverse transactions? I think if you look at the protocol, it's how it was set up, right? It was more on hash. So any particular thing is that it moves on with that, and that's why it cannot be found and it cannot be reversible. That's that's the theory of what, how it should be actually set up so that it doesn't allow reversible situations. That's why it goes in blocks and then you know it's got the time base and then it has an algorithm to say that it must come. So that's that's what it's a secure part. Sure. And um, the next question addressed to Ms. Susanna is, I do believe that banks are among the first adopters of this technology. Considering that information is available publicly, publicly how are banks adopting the technology? Are they relying on public miners or going in-house? If it is in-house, is it independent? Um, it hasn't been publicly reported, but if you look at what uh, HSBC actually made an announcement here, okay, uh, I don't have insights, okay, I can't comment in, in, in detail uh, what it was writing on, uh, but you, what they did was, was on, on their trade financing. Okay? So they actually executed the first trade financing and there was a Malaysian uh, company that was on it. And uh, if it's my my point is I think most organizations that's large enough will be actually on a private domain because they've got customers. Okay, and customers detail if you look at it, and if they are a European based company, uh, just not think someone else about the risk. Uh, to me, because I also look at that side of areas of the risk, privacy is a big thing. Customer privacy. Secondly, um, if you do transactions, a lot of you know how the pricing all of that. So large organization, it will generally some of them will be on the private area. But what it does, which is quite interesting, is um, um, and this is public, so I can speak about it, right? Um, it just basically did the trade finance, and it mentioned it. Singapore and Malaysia trade. So the goods move takes about two days to move, right? So forty-eight hours. Under historical, if you do all those paper transactions in order to, you know, give to the counterparty, it generally takes something like 10 days. So two days to move the goods, 10 days to, to, to pay, pay for work, five times so on. But with the blockchain, uh, it actually reduces it to a day. Okay, but obviously they, no one talked about how much it costs that, huh? So that one we do not know. But if you know how much you're already paying on a trade financing, I think in order to learn the customers maybe for them, is to get the traction sometimes, they will just charge maybe the same or the same. What and and in, in that case they just want to take a break. And maybe some of the banks are investing. Thank you, Ms. Susanna. There's another user question posted to Mr. Eckler. The question is, for example, and data on their customers are confidential. Uh, Eckler mentioned a closed system. How would that work if a scenario whereby a group of miners control the bulk of processing, for example, forty five percent, will that not jeopardize the integrity of the blocks? Okay, so if they are mining on the 
right to the public blockchain, then then no, it is not. Uh, there's there's two separate parts here. The mining privately uh, does not. Uh, if you're talking about a private blockchain that is not a public ledger anymore. That means that it is um, on your own network. It's it's running your own database, really. So um, you're not affecting. For example, if I take Bitcoin as an example again, um, if you're running a private mining enterprise that is not running the Bitcoin protocol, then you are not affecting a public ledger at all. You know, if you're running something within, let's say you set up your own company and you want to run a lot of Rakan coins, right? And you want to run your own blockchain on that, that's considered a private blockchain. Meaning you have your own miners or your own consensus algorithm set up, but in no way do you interact with the public um, uh, Bitcoin ledger, right? But the downside of running a private um, blockchain, so the upside is maybe you want to have certain controls over the things that are happening in your own space, right? But the downside, you fall back to the initial discussion that I brought up, which is now you have a private blockchain and Basri and Co has a private blockchain, right? You guys have separate private blockchains. The fact that you don't share a public ledger means that you bring back the original issue of trust. And therefore, by having trust uh, being questioned, you need to reinsert other controls, right? Accountants to validate your ledger versus my ledger. You're back to square one. Um, so you actually need to put money aside, right? You have to implement more resources to make sure there's honesty between two parties. And by running private blockchain, this is a cost that you will have to bear. There are there are scenarios where this might be used in the future. For example, uh, many would have heard of things like Libra. Right within the within the uh, it's a federated uh, blockchain, right? So it's still considered relatively uh, private. It's not decentralized around the world, but it is controlled by a certain a number of parties. So because it is not a publicly run blockchain, then there's going to be a trust uh, that needs to be applied, whether the, the parties involved in the transaction do the right thing, and therefore the cost of the coin when you want to transact with a public coin will have a demand difference. So uh, there's a lot of consideration to put into place when you're running a, a uh, private versus public uh, blockchain. Uh, case in point, if you're running a scam company, right? You want to put your own Julian coin or something crazy like that, or Kopi coin, right? <laughs> and you run your own blockchain. Obviously, it is, it is blockchain. anybody can, can set up a blockchain in 15, 20 minutes, right? But you are mining it yourself, right? Therefore, you are requesting for people outside your organization to trust you. And again, wherever there's someone asking to trust you, there's going to be a cost involved. And if, if you, your coin is only backed by you and what you, your miners are saying, then it, it has no value to me. Why should I pay you any money for it? And therefore, you will lose out. Right? So the, the, the risk of, of, of having your coin creator will keep that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Edgar. And Mr. Vincent, there's a question for you here. Okay. Yeah, the question is, as the future of business, everything will be digitized. What business types blockchain will not be advised to be used? Okay, the last part of the question. Uh, can you the yes, the future of business is uh, digitization. In, uh, yes. Today's world. So the question is, which business types um, that is not advised to use blockchain? Is there any particular business uh, that is that is not advised to use blockchain? That's the question. Okay. You see, the thing is that uh, not uh, blockchain is not applicable for every use case. Let's say, for example, when we talk about. Um, a network when we talk about uh, trust when we talk about all this supposedly if you think about grab taxi grab taxi is also a, a business that actually bridge various drivers to various consumers who want to take a ride so when i call for a grab taxi i do not know who is the driver i do not know whether the car is safe or not safe uh, but the taxi come, I will just hop onto the taxi and uh, I will just use the service. 
So when you look at the blockchain, um, uh, back to the economics of blockchain, there's a slide that I talk about the cost of verifications as well as the cost of uh, networking. That uh, when, when it comes to a certain type of business whereby maybe, oh, everybody trusts Grab because Grab verified the driver and method and the driving license, they have bought the insurance and all that stuff. Uh, so therefore, I, I use a Grab taxi. So the, the, the company has already established itself to, to, to be trustworthy. So there's consumers and drivers. Now, the thing is that uh, when it comes to blockchain, if you look at the economics of it, uh, it overcome the trust barrier of the participants in the network. So, so uh, if you are looking at a certain type of applications of a blockchain that do not actually uh, uh, overcome uh, uh, the barrier of the trust uh, among the participants, um, then that is probably a not not a good application. So, so, so what I'm trying to say is that if I just want to have a data ray, I just want to have a, a something like that. Those kind of business uh, actually do not use uh, need to use blockchain at all. Uh, if I already have a familiar doctor uh, that is, um, uh, I always frequently visit. I I don't need a blockchain to see a doctor. But uh, if let's say I'm a new 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 person in the market, I want to depend on people that I don't know. But uh, the doctor has. <laughs> Uh, credentials or past track records that are verified on the blockchain and I need to uh, uh, overcome the trust barrier um, and blockchain can help me, that, that would probably be a, a one good example of uh, applications of a blockchain. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. There's another one, uh, another question related to the economies of blockchain. So the question is actually for Ms. Lee. How do we get involved in developing the economies of blockchain? How do we get started? Um, I would say that uh, when it comes to getting started on learning blockchain, right? Uh, uh, I myself also been through the journey. I'm an electrical engineer. Yeah, I write accounting software. But the problem is that uh, I'm very curious. Everybody is talking about blockchain. And uh, so the first thing I did was actually to go and Google and a list of all the blockchain courses. And then I, I start taking some of them, reading all over the place, YouTube, this and that. Uh, eventually, uh, for my case, uh, uh, I think that you will seriously learn about the blockchain and getting started when you have a project in mind. So um, uh, be, be it for myself, the project is about um, um, thinking about how I can contribute uh, to the accountant, accountancy, accountant, uh, accounting world uh, since I'm doing accounting software to actually um, uh, adopt the blockchain uh, in this industry. So that is for me the motivation. So, um, uh, but for uh, each one of you, it could be, um, you must first have a motivation. You don't just keep learning, reading, learning, reading, and then you get lost in the world of uh, information and uh, uh, every article that you read is also you know they, they have their own opinion and all that so uh, uh, i would say that the, the best way to get started is actually to to have a project in mind thank you mr Vincent. and if i may move on uh, to the topic of costs and benefits now so the, there are two questions addressed to miss susanna the first one is role of minus is key in blockchain and and Mining is highly costly. What are the way forward of reducing the bureaucracy in mining? Um, well, I'm not the key proponent, but I just share with you uh, when uh, part of our firm is doing uh, some of the projects. Okay, um, the cost that um, I think a lot of things now are looking into probably bringing the cost down is the one the usage now. Yes. Okay. Now the second thing is about uh, batching the, the multiple ledgers. So uh, when a firm uh, worked on one particular project, like I mentioned for the wine industry of one organization, it was I believe it must be in Europe, uh, what they wanted okay, uh, was actually to ensure the authenticity that when someone buys the wine, it was actually real. Right, you pay let's say 100 US or 80 US for that bottle, right? 
So what they, that organization did was, um, was they wanted to make sure from the farm to the distributor to the end customer, it has that authenticity. That's why they want to um, and some of it is we, I mean, technology is pretty new as you heard from all the people, right? So, technology we all know that when it's new, it's normally quite perfect. Yeah. At some point in time, there's a tipping point that it might drop through. So, 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 in that particular case, I think it was something like we came from about 100 US to something, and then now I think it's gone to about US $9 uh, from the batching situation. And the question is the magic is to uh, one US uh, uh, transaction. Uh, time will see, but I think these are some of the things. So, if you're thinking of building your, your, your own blockchain block, please, you know, you must have a lot of financial muscle. Second thing, please, if in Malaysia you're doing it, look at the Securities Commission requirements. Five million paid up capital at least, robust risk management, okay, security, uh, as well as uh, restriction. Don't go and uh, offer financial assistance for purposes of purchasing. So there are rules. So if, if whether it's Malaysia, whether it's Singapore, whether it's US, regulators knows that this is coming up. There are rules. Thanks, Ms. Susanna. And this question is also uh, uh, related to cost and benefit analysis. How do blockchain can be incorporated in the accounting system control, which may already be built in ERP? Yeah, I, I think if you uh, look at the uh, blockchain phenomena, people look at it and say that ERP generally right? it's all within your own ecosystem. So now with the blockchain, the, the ERP is actually a lot of people using, sharing it with counterparty. And some of you in your organization, today most of your ERP, sometimes some people are already on prem, right? But some people are also doing on the cloud because they're paid to do this, right? And, and, and that's where some of this phenomena will kick in. You don't need, so, and some people don't even own the ERP, right? Your <coughs> IT guys are not only, it's, it's actually put out in a cloud. So with that particular ecosystem, I believe that when the participants use this, that particular area, then that information will have something called the blockchain will take care of the transactions that's happening. But you can only see yours now, right? Like you do online banking, you can only see yours now. E-wallet also, you can only see yours. But then the guys who is actually operating that, he, they see everyone. So that company that is running that, if it's whether it's a that is where we talk about it needs to be audited so that you can then feel that you can trust it to go with that. Then how does that information then talk to you with your own ERP system, depending on what you use? That's where, from EY's perspective, that's why when we talk about our EY uh, uh, analyzer for blockchain, we then pull data from different sources and to make sure that it matches. So that phenomenon, I will say, is still building, but maybe a certain uh, so-called developed nation is maybe in place already. The POC has gone beyond and is some are a little bit in Thank you, Ms. Susanna. And the next question will be SMEs as the backbone of our economic development. And in your opinion, do you think that SME will get advantages from blockchain and to what extent? So I'll get over to Ms. Um, two, two, two parts to this, right? Um, for SMEs, on, on one hand, you can take advantage of a public ledger that should bring down the cost of managing your books. Right, that's that's like a short of immediate uh, thing that you can see. Another interesting point to look at for SMEs in the future is uh, the interesting space to look at is crowdfunding. Um, a, a key uh, part of uh, blockchain is uh, the concept of tokenization. Right, so we don't have this uh, in in our uh, country yet, but the idea here is that if you can tokenized company, right? You, you don't no longer need to be a really big company or really well capitalized just to go and IPO. Previously, it has, there's been a lot of uh, discussion around like, uh, I don't know if you've heard of ICOs, and those those were basically unregulated um, company activity sharing, right? But in the case of a regulated version of this, this can really, really boost the SME industry. Right, we're talking about the ability of smaller companies to go out there and say, hey, I'd like to tokenize 
commercial of my business. You know, I have a game plan, business plan, and I want to sell up my uh, company for a certain, uh, uh, to break it up into some token on a regulated platform. And that platform can then put your company shares available on market. And then you could run a secondary market uh, where your, uh, your uh, equity is tradable. Um, among everybody, and, and this allows the public to throw money into your company without needing to go through a very complicated process of investing in stocks and things like that. So it really opens up the ability of uh, funding for SMEs in the future. That's you know one of the big things I can think of for SMEs, uh, aside from bringing down the cost of running a business and things that can take advantage of public uh, ledgers. Thank you, Mr. Edna. Mr. Vincent, do you have anything? to add on with regards to SMEs and blockchain? Does it really matter the SME is not SME? Um, I think in my opinion, certain sectors of fields that are currently dominated by major big players uh, could be opening up for uh, SME should the blockchain become popular. So uh, uh, it, it is uh, because when you have a uh, Let's say, for example, a small company secretary, a small audit firm, uh, if they want to go get up with big boys like EY or whatever, right? It, it is quite difficult. But, but uh, if, let's say, the blockchain become popular and everybody can use the blockchain to do audit, then the small players become uh, uh, can be uh, 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 participants in a very big uh, uh, audit project or audit uh, customer case or something like that, and and each player is contributing to different part of the of the audit process. So uh, uh, in fact, uh, it is not a lose to uh, big players, but it is just that they they suddenly have the avenue of uh, having a more uh, more more people behind it, and then uh, the ecosystem become bigger. <coughs> So I think uh, it increases the pie for everybody uh, when blockchain become uh, popular, especially the SME, opening up more opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. And uh, Mr. Murali, would you like to add? Yes, I would like to add SMEs and blockchain. Um, I think the SME can participate in some of those, but you know, before participation, uh, you must uh, find and assess uh, what it can do for you and uh, make sure that, you know, uh, I call it the risk assessment. Uh, and and you know, if you are a content, don't think that you have to do it alone. Okay, like I said, you've, in your organization, you, you will have some of your other people who is helping out, you know, and you can look at it and assess whether it's feasible and promise that whether you feel comfortable to go on that. Um, and if you really look at it, even like today you talk about online shopping and all those kinds of stuff, right? A lot of the people are able to place their goods to be sold, right, in a, in a, in a, in a digital market and, and they earn. Whether you want a uh, quid and now you can put it somewhere and you can sell and you collect your money and then you deliver, right? So, to me, blockchain is just a technology, but it will open up all this, but at the end of the day, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, what, if you dispatch, the money comes back, okay, and it gets recorded, and then you don't want information that you freely given that is sold to your competitor or freely put up in a social media. So, so these are the things you need to think about the security of those like, and, and which platform you go. Thank you, Ms. Susanna. And the next question is addressed to all the uh, panel speakers. How does the company, which is an early adopter of blockchain technology, handles transactions with non-adopters who are still using traditional business approaches, for example, payment by checks. Any of you would like to take, take a start? The question is, how does a company which is an early adopter of blockchain handle transactions with non-adopters who are still using traditional uh, business approaches? I, I, I just don't think that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think mean, you have to operate dual process for a certain period, right? Until you get in one digital system. So if you, if you can't, it's like, I think a simple analogy is like how you text someone on WhatsApp and they don't have that, right? You just use SMS. Yeah. 
or there could be a space for an intermediary, right? It's, I mean, where does the demand as a business, right? So <laughs> you could, you know, you could set up a business that say, hey, all of you that don't want to use this, you know, come transact to us. We'll talk to the blockchain guys for you, right? That's one way of thinking about it. Uh, but I really uh, stop using chance. <laughs> Uh, I think so. Um, it depends on who is the intermediary. If they are your supplier, you're already uh, driving on a network that's quite fast. I speak, and then they're still on bicycle. I think you better ask them coach to get on the high speed as well. But if not, they might be left behind because they might not be relevant to your business model. I think that's, that's one of the factors. Yeah, and I don't want to add on. Um, most most of the transactions these days are going online anyway, right? I, I think very rare is it uh, outside of maybe uh, legal space that we use chat so much. Um, so it's already happening. So right now, if you're in that group, you are in a very, very niche group. So it's probably time to consider moving. And that's why the cost is very expensive. The regulators made it purposely expensive. So that is to deter people up. Thank you. And this question is actually with regards to the perspective of ethical issues. So it's addressed to uh, all the speakers as well. Uh, this question is from Brian. Do we, need, do we still need to be ethical in a world of blockchain, seeing as the system will work to keep us, uh, to, to keep us honest anyway? So what is the take of our speakers? Uh, do we still need to be ethical in a world of blockchain, seeing that the system will work to keep us honest anyway? Uh, I believe it depends on the uh, smart contract. Uh, so, uh, in fact, when you look at the uh, audit, audit industry, right, they are uh, they used to only audit the accounting book, you know, the, the transactions, whether they are classified to the correct DL code and all that stuff. But uh, I believe in the, the, the future of accounting profession, it would it actually, including the auditors, would also be auditing the uh, smart contract. So when they are auditing the smart contract, uh, it is not just whether they are um, auditing whether there's anything hanky-panky within the smart contract, but they are also auditing the smart contract, whether they are uh, fulfilling certain uh, security requirements, certain um, uh, the, the, the governance of the organizations and, and, and so on. Because when when we fully uh, have an autonomous organization on the blockchain, uh, uh, how the vote is being kept, let's say a decision has to be made within the company to go, not to go, uh, and approval need to be obtained, uh, uh, etc. So um, uh, I think uh, uh, from this perspective, um, the, the, as long as the audit of the uh, smart contract is done well, the design of the smart contract and the architecture is done well, then uh, it should be uh, quite uh, bulletproof. Just like the Bitcoin, even if somebody unethical, they want to like try to try to be unethical, they can't. They just cannot simply steal the coin from the others. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a transaction, right? It, if you want to be an ethical and you set something up in the blockchain space that takes advantage of people, it is possible and it can be even worse because it's unmutable. Um, we see that today, right? In, in people who try and scam others by transacting. Um, it's really just a transaction uh, or a method of transaction and settlement. So if you if you set up things that, that take advantage of people, uh, obviously, you should not. But at least now, there's a way of, of uh, tracking. I won't, I won't use the word tracking. It's not easy. But uh, that is a public ledger that if you are caught, you don't run from, right? Uh, but other than that, it's it's just a matter of transaction. Yeah, ethical and ethical. Ethical is whether you respect or whether blockchain and not just a fundamental business. And you're dealing with any company. If it's unethical, stay away from it. Yeah, so I think that question was, we still need to, so I, I don't think it's a choice whether you can go or not. I think as a good human being, you have to be ethical at all times, right? So, 
big technology comes in, it shouldn't really compromise your model dynamics. It should complement or enhance what you already do. Thank you, Mr. Murali. And related to ethical stuff, a uh, very yeah, related one on how will blockchain technology impact money laundering activities? This is addressed to all the speakers. How will blockchain technology impact money laundering activities? Uh, in my in my opinion, if all the businesses, uh, let's say if the, the government also want to promote the blockchain so that it can collect the tax revenue and all that uh, easily and uh, you know transparently, and uh, in fact with uh, the blockchain with this private data, uh, public private data, private blockchain and uh, public blockchain thing, it is possible to carry out most, if not all, of the transactions uh, on the chain while still keeping the confidentiality of the data in the chain. So, so that way, uh, actually, it is very easy for the government to uh, uh, extract the information that they have permission to, and then subsequently make use of uh, AI or some of the fraud detection software or tools to actually uh, uh, detect the money laundering quite easily, I would say. So I think it's a good thing for, for good uh, good uh, governance as well uh, for the country. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. Yeah, so so this is this is obviously for, for us one of the regulated uh, changes, this is a very big deal, right? Um, um, one way I can put it to you guys on how think about it is we are gatekeepers of the on ramp and the off ramp between the world of crypto and fiat. Um, if you're doing crypto to crypto transactions, these are pseudonymous most of the time. It's not easy to track. But it is one step more safe than going cash. Because theoretically, the most anonymous is to carry a bag of cash and give it to someone else. But in the world of uh, cryptocurrencies, if you're transacting via blockchain, then there at least is a, a pseudonymous record that could be tracked if, if the authorities have the capability of. You know, tracing back, which they do have some capability of. The other way to challenge the uh, or to, to protect against that money laundering is uh, as regulate uh, sorry as regulated exchanges, we are very uh, focused on managing the on ramp and the off ramp. Meaning, if the most you can do is protect your money. Like Malaysia can protect the ringgit from being used, uh, and the US will protect the dollar from being used in, in the money laundering acts. Right, it is the on ramp and the on ramp from your currency that is where the problems occur. And if you're trading with anyone in ringgit, right, most of the system would require you to have KYC. Then, so if you are taking ringgit and trying to send it off to somewhere else and you're trying to off ramp it via the exchanges, and they obviously have KYC on you, you will be able to be traced. Um, so you can actually, you can actually. Uh, uh, have a bit more control over it. It is still a very gray area. Obviously, trading crypto, crypto can be uh, is used right to, to play around in this space. But as a technology evolves, uh, we have companies out there, local science and, and things like that, that help us uh, track uh, where sources are coming from or going to. That you know, if, if they are triggering red flags, we can actually flag them in our system. Uh, it's going to be one of those wars where you know there'll be technology versus <laughs> there'll be defense and attack, right? You know, there'll be forever this balance between the aggressors and the defenders, but uh, that's the best way technology develops. Um, as mentioned, I think I'm now related to money laundering, they have got their certain act, and again, it's all about that. Like, uh, so the gentleman mentioned it's all about KYC. So the other portion will be actually related to the security of that. Um, so if someone operates and you do need to then know what is the level of transactions and those are very clear cut in the uh, government or regulatory rules, uh, and then it, it becomes a little bit more, it crosses border, I think. That is where the rules are not clear. So it is within the legion, the legion you will know, right? And within the legion you are moving things out, uh, you also have to exchange control and that needs to look at the end of the case. But then if it's posted somewhere else outside and the legion uses this, 
I think this is where the world currently doesn't have enough legislation to catch where it's supposed to. So as part of the due diligence, as well, I would say, for the risk assessment and participate in all this, know where the source of pain, who is the counterparty you're dealing, and how safe it is, and whether you know, that's the So this question is addressed to Ms. Susanna, actually. How will blockchain guard against hackers stealing customers' information? Okay, if, if uh, I mean, we're not, we didn't go into the, the, the technical side of it. You know, blockchain has a couple of layers, right? The, the blockchain layer, then you've got the protocol layer, and then you've got the token layer, right? They call it the token. And within that, if you really look at it, uh, there are various security levels there is multiple layers. I cannot remember to tell, I believe it was uh, I got to show the slides of the keys, right? And all these keys have, you know, it's built like, you know, like those James Bond movies that goes like and then the, the keys are actually in different different modes. And you even talk about the wallet. Okay, it has the you know uh, the hot wallet, the cold wallet and they call it the deep freeze. So it's thought in such a way that if you want to break it has to be couple of chains. So that's why when some, uh, for us and why when we talk about trust, we always talk about trust by design. So we only accept or deal with customers, okay, if you have to do advisory or as well as insurance work, is we, we do need to do the background check to understand whether our funds are really putting in the right design from the start. Because, you know, you need to, can we launch it when uh, you build all your your, your, your own design properly or not is going to be a, you know quite a big risk to every participant including the guys who are going to do that. Thank you, Susanna. The next question is any applications for the blockchain wallets in Malaysia? Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure how the question is phrased. Are we saying that is there any application for us to develop blockchain wallets here or are we talking about using the international blockchain, uh, the, the non country specific blockchain wallets in the Asian ecosystem? Uh, I guess the way you can think about it is if you are going to transact from crypto to ringgit, right, that is your definition of uh, using it in Malaysia, then there will be some point where you have to go to a system like ours where you you have to register a KYC uh, or, or something like that. But yes, you could. Uh, use your, your wallets. And uh, if you have businesses in Malaysia that are accepting Bitcoin or accepting crypto and you're going to pay by your wallet, uh, technically it's just scanning a QR code, you know, but of course those businesses would have to answer it to the uh, security commission if they're going to be doing, uh, you know, working in that space as well. But yes, um, if you have an application or a wallet, uh, that you want to transact in a local economy, yeah, there's nothing stopping you. Uh, but if you're transacting with ringgit specifically, then at some point, you know, you need to, to adhere to the local regulation. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Edwards. So, is there anything to add on that? Um, currently, I think um, in in Malaysia, right, on uh, most of the time. Apart from looking at the investment of uh, blockchain as a as an investment as digital as in a digital asset, uh, on a day to day, you currently, I I don't think it can be popular so soon or any real application because let's say the bank the guard specify that you have to, uh, you need to make bring it as an official legal tender, right? So you can't really use a a blockchain to buy, uh, to pay for goods and services in general. Maybe if only for specific product that you have a certain arrangement. Maybe yes, but but uh, uh, it can't when it can't be used for uh, general payment. Then uh, the next next thing would be a blockchain's application in the B two B. But the blockchain application in B two B, if you talk about hyperledger and all that, I don't think it is uh, very much ready uh, for the Malaysian businesses yet. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. Uh, since you're on the line, uh, how about you addressing these two questions that are related to you? Uh, the first question is, what are the challenges for companies to implement blockchain? And what are the pros and cons of blockchain? Okay. Uh, number one, 
I would think of the challenges for the Malaysian company to implement blockchain is there is no not enough vendor. There's not enough players in the market because we know that blockchain is uh, uh, the economics of blockchain is about network, is about solving the last mile problem. And when you don't have enough vendor, the eco ecosystem is not big enough, then uh, you, you can't just do it by yourself, even if you want to. So um, uh, number two is, of course, the knowledge part of the blockchain, the understanding of the blockchain, what it can do. So the ecosystem, the vendor, the tool and all that is not is not so much uh, ready at the moment for Malaysian small businesses. And then uh, the second question that you asked was, uh, uh, so, sorry, the first one is... Uh, yeah, the pros and cons. Okay, the pros and cons of the blockchain, of course, I, uh, from my perspective, I would say that uh, if the blockchain is implemented, the definitely the pros would be to save costs in terms of uh, improving efficiency of the uh, employees. Uh, let's just say, for example, if the black banks are putting the financial record and transaction into a private blockchain or uh, and businesses are able to sync to the blockchain to, um, to tally with their accounting transactions, they will save a lot of time doing the bank reconciliation. That's one example. So uh, the benefits will definitely come in terms of... Uh, uh, uh efficiency of the of the employees and the business and it may also open up new business opportunity uh for businesses to uh um to do work for businesses that don't know them so 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 that is one part the cons part i would say is that um there are a lot of businesses that uh i mean whether you like it or not not everybody is like up to date with the technology so the cons i would say to the companies that are less well prepared would be um uh, losing business to um uh, businesses that are very tech savvy just like uh, when the lazada came uh, in the erp space i have a number of customers that actually uh, closed their business uh, because they do not sell in the Lazada and then they are not competing uh, with the big boys, with the social networking, social marketing and other stuff, then they, they lose out. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. So we have about uh, five minutes left before we, we wrap up uh, this forum uh, based on our schedule. So the next three questions are actually related to Mr. Morley, whereby um, they are interested to know the regards to a digital transformation in itself. So from Sean, as a digital transformation as a digital transformation leader in Intel, how is blockchain being used in Intel? And the other question is can you share some cases of processes in shared services at Intel that are using blockchain? And this this question it asks uh, this person asks which organization have led blockchain transformation and successful? So I guess uh, perhaps you could yeah, I think I need a couple of minutes. It's very short. We are not using blockchain yet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an area where, so I think the engineering side, we are developing some solutions, but in finance, uh, we haven't really explored this area. We're still, in the, we're still more focusing on the robotical sense and the other sense. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Morelli. So, um, any idea, guys, uh, our panel speakers, if you could share one example of an organization that have uh, led a blockchain transformation successfully? Uh, you're saying, so the idea here is that it is transformation, I think, applied blockchain and right. successfully. I think most of them are going to be the experimental stages right now. I can't think of one of the top. Yeah, I think uh, this is kind of this. This is kind of the scenario right here because in Malaysia, most of us have, most of the organization are still in the infancy, as uh, shared by uh, our panel speaker. So we are moving uh, towards the end, whereby I still have four questions over here. If I may seek the cooperation of speakers, any one of you would like to uh, address in a very concise manner. The first question is um, how blockchain accounts for the approval transactions? The post on the account. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it, it doesn't change your method of the debit credit. Okay. 
more important is that I think uh, we had a discussion on this with one of the colleagues here. Uh, you know, your debit credit still is the same. The question is that how you're going to get that and how you're going to report, right? And, and the processes. Uh. But if you actually, I think the other thing is, uh, if some of you are accountants, uh, they say, hey, blockchain investment, uh, what is it called? Uh? And we've said that it is definitely not cash and cash equipment. Okay? It cannot be called an investment. It's likely to be called an intangible. And then you need to look at the cost minus impact for those who are accountants here. Okay? If the market value of certain things is higher, sorry guys, still cost, huh? Okay. Uh, okay. For, so, for accountants. Yeah, so, not from accounting background, I need to help you figure out what that meant, but I think I have a, a decent idea. So, uh, this is where the application of, of uh, something like a private blockchain can come into the space, right? Um, where if you're a company offering uh, term payments for something and you can't do that in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a settle settlement on transaction. Every time we pay the uh, block is cycle, it is considered a settlement, right? You can't say I owe, you, owe this to you. But a company may come up and say that, okay, if you come into our space, you buy, you, you come to our space with, uh, and you put money into our kind of a, a uh, private uh, blockchain where we will actually use your crypto and spread the payments out over a particular amount of time. And uh, you know, that service is then offered by that company and you are dealing specifically with that company, but that company then becomes an intermediary to deal with the blockchain where the payment system is uh, managed by them. Right? But Bitcoin itself, then no, you can't, you won't be able to because the settlement is in every transaction. Thank you, Mr. Edward. And I have the last three questions here. We are wrapping up now. Now, last but not least, because concerns is on corporate sustainability today. So, to what extent does blockchain impact the corporate sustainability? Any students would like to take question? Yeah, uh, I think I can uh, say something, uh, something, something about this sustainability of the blockchain thing. Um, yeah. uh, one of the slides that uh, I presented just now that shows the ecosystem of the blockchain consists of the developer, the maintainer of the blockchain, the architect, the, the, the auditor of the blockchain, the, and, and all that. So in the blockchain world, right, designing the token is actually like writing a business plan whereby you actually uh, specify clearly, okay, what do the blockchain miner get for maintaining or verifying the transactions and, and all that. So for, for a blockchain to be successful, when you look at the, it's, it's like pretty much like how accountants look at the uh, business, uh, business plan. So, so what happened is that for a business plan to work, it needs to consider all the economics part of the blockchain whereby uh, will people want to use it? How many people will be using it? Is it enough volume to sustain or, or the, what is the overhead of, of running the blockchain? Because whether you like it or not, there will be servers uh, running in the cloud, uh, accepting the transactions uh, all the time. So, so um, uh, these servers cost money also. So um, it's not like uh, everything is free, although the cost may not be significant, but there's still cost. And then uh, 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 whether it makes sense for the other businesses or software companies to actually integrate it with the blockchain. So uh, when it comes to the sustainability of the blockchain, usually uh, one of the very critical uh, that we need to study is the, the white paper. And uh, of course, the execution of the white paper. I, I would say it depends on that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vincent. Uh, maybe I, just, I think on corporate sustainability, at the end of the day, uh, you know, there must be certain rules. Lah, huh? Like if your money is somehow somewhere there, it's ever neutral. That's why people who are operating has to have those trust accounts. It has the risk management and the security. So all those key things has to be in place in order to safeguard the players in the market. So uh, that's one of it. Secondly, uh, whether there's economy or scale, whether you can survive, I think that's very debatable, right? It's sometimes 
Um, you can build a car, uh, like even if you build a Tesla, it's still making losses. So the question is, um, can it be sustainable? I think that's where, because it's a new technology, that's why certain organizations don't have the risk of the type to go on. Thank you, Ms. Susanna. And then finally, uh, we have uh, 120 seconds left. And this question is, do you think that our education is evolving towards the industry's expectation? And do you think our country, Malaysia, is ready for blockchain technology? So I open the floor to these speakers to wrap it up in the next 20 seconds. So the first question, is our education evolving towards industrial expectation? Evolving, yes, but I think it's still uh, quite a way to go. Um, uh, in my opinion, I think there's still a very big gap. Um, um, when I hire a lot of uh, graduates or those with uh, whatever qualifications, uh, um, of course, uh, with what is happening in the industry, actually, uh, it is I mean, they, they, the, the people who are getting the job may not have the skills, but one very important uh, thing was mentioned by Murali or Edgar uh, just now is the, the, the ability to learn rather than uh, the skills that you, you, you don't need to equip with all the skills, but you need to have the skill to learn. So, so um, uh, I think uh, um, maybe if you're talking about our country, I would think that uh, it would certainly help if we uh, focus on uh, getting the students to acquire the learning skills instead of focusing on the black shoes and the white shoe issues thing. You know? So, so, uh, uh, so that that would that, that definitely uh, uh, help lah to. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Nelson. And do you think that uh, our country is ready for blockchain? I pass this question to Mr. Ekka. Is Malaysia ready for blockchain? Is it a matter of uh, ready or do we have a choice? The rest of the world is uh, going down this space right now. So um, we can either uh, go forward or you know, be left behind. And um, I can say that I think in, in Malaysia, they are uh, actively participating in this space uh, because of the regulations from spiritual commissions. And I think that, that shows that we are definitely uh, participating. But yeah, whether we're ready or not, I don't think we have choice in Miss Susanna, what would be your take on this? Uh, I concur that I think um, we've got no choice if the whole ecosystem is going towards that. Uh, I think more important is uh, uh, it's a space that not everyone can. I mean, people can participate, but people who own it, I think there'll be very few. Um, I, I'm actually quite optimistic, I was just sharing with a young partner this morning, I said, why didn't we think about our pharma industry all the way, you know, to, to, to the consumers or the retail, and I think that should be done. Thank you, Ms. Susanna. So, really, anything to add on to that? No, I'll give you back your time. Okay, thank you very much for the understanding. So, please allow me to close the forum now. Now, we are in a not so perfect world, so there are other considerations in this game changing technology of accounting. Fear is one of the reasons, fear of how technology will disrupt an industry that has been dependent so much on human oversight and scrutiny. So, jobs will be affected, yes, and that's very an issue for most companies. However, cost money, not stuff number, is what keeps the C suite awake at night. And blockchain, as uh, you have heard from the speakers, still remain apparently costly if it's still in the current form. So nevertheless, our experts here agree that blockchain will not disrupt the industry anytime too soon, but its efficiency should not be underestimated or ignored. So with the increasing adoption of blockchain technology, as you have also heard, the role of an accountant will, be, will change, but it will not be totally eliminated. So accountants who can embrace the skill rhythm themselves, new technologies such as AI, blockchain, will definitely be well ahead of the game, and ultimately provide the service to the client and contribute significantly to the business sustainability. So guys, with this takeaway from today's forum, we hope you have gained fruitful insights on blockchain and the accountancy profession. And thank you to all our honorable speakers for your sharing, for your time, for your knowledge and experience. 
as well as to our respective audience for your overwhelming participation. We have actually over almost 30 questions received and our speakers have greatly addressed uh, almost all of them. And as well as to our VIPs and our sponsors, without you guys, uh, this event will not uh, happen. So thank you for your support and we wish everyone a great weekend ahead. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the appreciation and closing ceremony. I would now like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors, ACCA, Intel, Javel, and Luminance. Our event is a success with your contributions. Plus, AGC 605 Accounting for Managers alongside the GSD would like to thank all of our sponsors sincerely. We would now like to call Dr. Fadia, accompanied by Dr. Yuarash to present souvenirs to the sponsors, moderator, and speakers. I would now like to invite our main sponsors and co-sponsors representative to get ready. First up, Ms. Lin Tan Chin from ACCA. Next up, Ms. Kokila from Tiagiro. Our third sponsor, Ms. Kampo or Ms. Lady from Intel. Our last sponsor would be Mr. Sean for Luminance. <laughs> Next up would be our moderator, Dr. Chiu Ai Ping. Our second panel speaker, Mr. Lee Hong, Mr. Vincent Lee Hong Fei, will be represented by CG, our project manager. Mr. Murali. Thank you. Last but not least, Miss Susanna Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to thank you for participating in this forum and it is our sincere hope you enjoyed this program. Have a safe trip home and have a great weekend. We have now reached the end of the forum. We would like to invite our distinguished speakers, moderators and VIPs to lunch located at the VIP room. To the rest of the audience, please stay back as we will be informing you on how to get your e-electronics certificate for your participation of 
Ms. Farr. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an announcement for the electronic certificate. A QR code is being presented at the screen in front of you. The QR code is only available for the next 10 minutes. Can you scan and fill up your email address, name, and please submit to the Google form. You will then receive the e-certificate in your respective emails. For any problem or inquiries, please send an email to the contact person in the, in the screen above you. Once you're done with the certificate of participation, you can enjoy your lunch located at the next room. Thank you. If if you want, they can send to your seniors. Yeah. Can them yeah, give me my name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 